there's more depth in nature's design language than they told us in school because the way the sound waves move and create energy around it is completely opposite to the way that the light moves and creates movements around it. So, but nobody talks about this. And nobody talks about this even in metaphysical healing circles. We talk in abstract ways about there's sound healing and there's healing with light and color, both systems that I absolutely love. But we have to see that they are two separate systems working with two different types of waves. When we move into a future paradigm that is far more enlightened than what we have today, where we're going to be using energies for healing, we're going to understand that these are two different types of waves we can use for healing. And the effect of the sound waves may not be identical to the effect of the light and color waves. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul welcomes back Dr. Robert Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert is the Director of Studies at the Visica Institute, and his previous episode with Paul was this podcast's most popular episode with Spotify listeners in 2023. A big thank you to our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley, and Organifi, and our podcast sponsor, Wild Pastures. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products that they produce. Please check the show notes for links and details at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Paul and Dr. Gilbert are today discussing the topics of spirit, mind, and healing. Today, one of my favorite people in the world to talk to is back. That's Robert J. Gilbert founder of the Vesica Institute, the first instructor in biogeometry trained by Ibrahim Karim in the U.S., maybe in the world, I'm not sure. But my last podcast with Robert was absolutely excellent. I had a huge response to it. Many people bought his courses and have told me how grateful they were to find the information. So I'll say right up front, um, Get over to the Vesca Institute. Check out his courses. They're all very in line with the things that I teach and that I think everybody needs to study. And I found Robert Gilbert years ago actually studying sacred geometry, turned him on to uh, Jason Picard and Kara, and they looked into his teachings, took some of his courses, and reinvigorated my interest. And then my friendship with Ibrahim Karim led me back to Robert. So, Robert, welcome back. Wonderful. Thanks for having me again. Oh, it's always a pleasure, man. You're so deep. I love hanging out with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, it's fun, you know, when, when people like you and I spend our whole life studying and practicing, there's not too many people you can really have a deep conversation with and get a real good exchange where you walk away saying, you know, with that sense of, ah, uh -huh, oh, I didn't think of it that way or, oh, wow, I got to look into that. And uh, I certainly get that from you. So thank you. Today, we're going to get into a, a lot of different things. I had quite a long list of uh, questions and dialogue points that we didn't get to in our first podcast. So as you know, this one takes us into all the things that we wanted to cover, but didn't get a chance to cover that I think are really important to talk about. So I titled the show spirit, mind, and healing, because we're going to talk a lot about that. So to begin with, in our previous episode, you gave us a very good explanation of the self and how sacred geometry underlies the creation of the self. I'm just curious what kind of response you receive from those um, that listen to that episode. As I said, I had a massive response. I don't know if you have a chance to follow that kind of stuff or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always have a chance to follow it very closely, but I did understand from my staff that we had a really excellent response to it, uh, both with people being interested in the courses and just general responses about how much people appreciated the depth of our conversation. So thank you so much for making that possible. Yes, I, I, uh, you have an open door to my podcast, pal. Anytime you, <laughs> and you. my house too, <laughs> and and my gym, and my sauna, and my cold plunge, and my swimming pool, and my rock garden, and my property, and my greenhouse. If the world falls apart, come stay with me. You won't be able to get rid of me. Thank you. Well, that's cool. We'll, <laughs> we'll 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 meditate together and keep the kids entertained and talk to them about how to get through it all. See the light. 
I'd like it if maybe you could begin today by overviewing what we'll cover and why it's important information to understand. Well, I think we're going to start today with topics related to what I describe coming from a French term from 100 years ago of waves of health and illness. And this is basically an energy-based paradigm for not only what kind of a being a human being is, but also for the entire energetic universe that we live in, and looking at how we can bring together all of these fragmented pieces that we get today from materialistic science, along with what we know from spiritual science and holistic science, to really heal our view of the energetic nature of the human being and the world we live in. So we'll be able to talk about some very large principles that I find don't get discussed very often, as well as practical applications of it with new healing sciences and new healing technologies, which are arising today. But although I'm sure you're very familiar with them and many of your viewers are familiar with this, we have the issue that is simply not being promoted to the general public, and they don't even know these types of energetic technologies exist. So we'll start with the foundation of what these energetic technologies are and how and why they work in a way that's outside of the normal paradigm. And then we'll continue that forward into looking at deeper aspects of human consciousness, development with the mind and spiritual development, and how all of these different pieces come together into something that people can apply practically in their own lives for their own health and for accelerating their own personal development. Yes, good. Now, in my studies of quantum physics, David Bohm, a lot of them, Fred Hoyle, uh, Richard Feynman, all the pioneers of quantum physics, Wolfgang Pauli, um, one of the things that come up came up several times, and I just want to hear your thoughts on, that's not in the outline, but I think it's a good place to start because of what you just said in the introduction. Basically, the consensus is amongst these geniuses like Bohm and others is that everything that we know of as the universe is basically energy and information. Some add frequency to that, but I think frequency is how it's expressed. And then we have Bohm's hollow movement, and we have uh, all the way back to Michael Talbot, the holographic universe. Do you agree that we're pretty much everything we're dealing with from our own bodies to the universe is basically energy and information? Yes, uh, absolutely, I do. You mentioned Michael Talbot's book on the holographic universe. That's such a wonderful book for people to start with if they don't have a background in this. It's so, so well done. And we need to be aware that at the beginning of the quantum physics revolution, and as that moved into nuclear physics in the modern form, you had people like Werner Heisenberg, who in his discussions kept going back to the ancient spiritual traditions. And so if you read Heisenberg's work on foundation of nuclear physics, it keeps going back to things like platonic sacred geometry and about these universal patterns that make up everything. And it really has that connection that you and I keep referencing about the ancient spiritual knowledge and how that connects and gives a larger context to modern scientific discoveries in a way that not only helps us to make sense of it and to apply it, but in a way it heals our understanding of this terrible rift that modern culture has created between so-called scientific knowledge and spiritual knowledge. It brings it all back into a unified form. One of the key things I think we need to take from classical traditions around the world is the idea that we are multidimensional beings living in a multidimensional universe, because physics, per se, is intentionally restricting itself to the physical plane level. And of necessity, it's included the level below the physical plane, which is the electromagnetic level, but it still it leaves the boundary there. So nothing literally metaphysical, nothing above the physical is allowed to be discussed. But if we look at a classical paradigm, and we'll use the common theosophical modern variant of this today, because different ancient traditions had different ways they would conceptualize this, whether it's ancient India or Egypt or what have you. But we have the idea that we have the physical plane, and that's the end of a process. Now, the problem is that in modern materialistic thinking, the physical plane is not only the only reality, 
It's also the, the cause level of all processes. But every ancient tradition knew that wasn't the case. And so what's, what's even left out of this modern seven-level paradigm that we have for things like the Theosophists, when people read us esoteric book today and they see about seven planes of nature or seven spiritual planes, we're still missing a very important piece of it, which is that below the physical is the electromagnetic. And this is something that was made very clear by Rudolf Steiner, that you know if we're going to look at this multidimensional model, we need to understand that what electromagnetic energy is is that vital force that is within the physical and is related to the breakdown of the physical plane. It's literally below the physical. And what's above the physical is what would be called chi, ki, prana, ether, indifferent, ancient civilizations, which is the true dynamic life force. It's not the same as electromagnetic energy, but it's the source of it at its greater biological life level. So above the physical, we have the level of what's sometimes called vital energy, or life force, or biological energy, that is really the the core energy that fuels everything. Now, at that level of the multidimensional structure of beings, this is what animates the corpse of a biological body so it can be alive. This was understood in every ancient tradition, and every ancient tradition used the concept of the life force as the primary thing for healing, because they understand that it is before the physical body. Now, this also relates us to the sacred geometry that we talked about in our last discussion, because all of these energetic fields are constructed at this etheric life force level, to use the Greek term, uh, to have a particular geometric pattern to them. Now, this is the level at which the higher planes, which are based on, we could say in our terminology today, information, then that information gets translated into a sacred geometric template where the form follows the function. The form is created by a forming process, as is discussed in modern biogeometry, to be able to then create the physical form as an expression of that energy or that function. So to really understand what in Steiner's work or in the Rosicrucian work would be described as the etheric formative forces what actually are the energy fields that, when crystallized and condensed and materialized, become a physical form, whether it's a mineral or a plant or an animal or a human, there's an energetic field behind it that constructs that form. So at that point, we're getting past the physical, which is not so much the cause, but more a result of these higher plane inputs. We have above it the life energy, which is a sacred geometric template of energy around which the matter will form and condense. It's literally a crystallization process, which is why the study of minerals and crystals can be very helpful for understanding how this works. Then above that level of the vital energy, we have the levels that in the human being become uh, our emotional and mental function. These could have other names in other traditions. So in some traditions, they'll use the term astral to mean our both our mental and emotional functioning. In some other groups, they'll use the astral to mean specifically what becomes the emotional body in the human being and in animals. And then they'll have the mental plane above that. Now we're getting into consciousness. Now we're getting into the ability to process information within a living being that is simply all living beings understood in the classical tradition are an emanation from the Godhead. They're an emanation from the one original source. And so we are like a fractal of the original pattern that is given independent activity. That's the nature of every individual human being. So above the level of the dynamic life force, chi, ki, prana, ether, and then the emotional, and then the mental, then in the most common modern Western formulation, you have what's referred to as the causal plane, Now, again, this is the information that is related to the particular developmental alchemical trajectory of a separate being, of a separate system. And so we think of that in the Himalayan terms of karma, of the particular things that have been done or acted on, and then the consequences of those actions by creating a particular force in the world. So everything is energetic. And so all of our thoughts, all of our emotions, all of our actions in the world, they create 
results. And so that's the causal plane where there's a larger plan for how all this is going to come together at very much an information level. Then above that, we have what's called the spiritual level. That's the point at which the original unity, the one of the Godhead, coming from the highest level, the divine. Divine, the highest level, is basically the one. It's a complete unified field. And that unified field is not just a unified field of energy. It's a unified field of consciousness. And so what every human being yearns for is to return to that primordial state that we all remember internally to a certain level of what it is to be unified and one with everything. And this also has led to a great growth recently of a resurgence of the psychotropic movement for that unity consciousness, that unity state. It's behind all of our romantic yearnings to find the other and to reconnect. So at the divine plane level, at the highest, is where everything comes from and it's still unified. The first step downward is the spiritual plane in which the different pieces of the information become manifest in specific separate systems. And when those systems become more aware, they become what we think of as spiritual beings, beings of a much higher state of evolution than human beings are at. They went through their, what we might think of as a human self-aware stage, many cycles previously, but the old traditions might refer to as the great ancient ones, and they had different names for these beings that we have today in the Western system with the angelic hierarchies, the angels, archangels, archai, all the way up to the cherubim, seraphim. And so we have this then movement of all these higher levels, as we have what we could refer to as the information level for the highest levels related to the divine. Uh, But really there, we're talking about a, a source level. We're talking about the core, whatever there is that makes up existence, that's where it comes from. At the divine level, everything is one. Then it splits into duality, polarity, and multiplicity at the spiritual plane level. Then it forms a plan for all these other beings that are going to get manifest out of the thought forms in the mind of God at the causal level. And then you have the beings taking on the ability to process information, to access the universal information field through their mental and emotional function. Then you have at the level of the dynamic life force, our ability to take in the dynamic energy, the universal chi field, as they say in China, to animate a uh, a flesh and blood body to become the vehicle, as they would say in the Himalayas, for the spirit to operate through and to be able to interact with the universal energy field, the universal chi field. And then all this crystallizes from the sacred geometric pattern from the information coming into the life energy fields and then to crystallize into the physical body. And then as the life energy is used up and decays, in the animation of physical forms, it then decays below the speed of light, as was discussed by Nikola Tesla. And then it becomes what he referred to as retarded Hertzian waves. And so what we deal with today in electromagnetic theory, Nikola Tesla himself, who created our AC energy conduction system we use everywhere today, he said, well, these are the lower level waves. These are the retarded Hertzian waves that are below the speed of light. It says there's something at a higher level, which we often refer to in a fairly generic term coming from electromagnetic and physics theory of scalar waves, although people interpret this in different ways. But that's uh, what I would say as a, a framework here for understanding how this quantum revolution is related, like going back to Heisenberg, to these ancient spiritual concepts. And then we have the aspect of this that's going to be fundamental for the discussion coming up, which is that the paradigm that we had for physics in the 1800s was completely overthrown starting in the year 1900 with the discovery of black body radiation. And so this created the foundation of what we think of as a quantum revolution in physics. And what it showed is that the 1800s idea that we were somehow going to find a universal building block of physical matter, like a little solid thing in a completely physical paradigm and physical universe that everything would be built on that physical thing because they wanted to prove everything was physical and get rid of all metaphysics. Instead, that whole project disintegrated (laughs) starting in the early (laughs) 1900s. And they found Mm -hmm. that actually it's not based on physical structures at all. 
physical structures come from the collapse of waves. And the waves are, in a sense, immaterial. I can't, like, hold a wave and hand it to you. It's not a physical object. But when the wave collapses, it then creates a particle. And these particles are so far apart from each other that if we were to change the scale from the microscopic to the scale that we live in and our physical existence, there would be football fields of space between these tiny particles. So all of creation is mostly empty space, but the Mm -hmm. empty space holds the unified field. That empty space holds the concept of the energy, the endless energy inside the vacuum itself. And so we have the idea of quantum energy and the quantum vacuum, that empty space, even though there's no particle there, is actually full of energy. And this energy is expressed in waves that then collapse to particles. So you'd think that after we had this incredible revolution in physics that gave rise to all of these incredible things in the last hundred years, including nuclear weapons, etc., And as we discussed in our previous conversation, I have a background where I was a U.S. Marine Corps instructor in nuclear, biological, chemical warfare defense. You'd think that after this incredible revolution in physics, that that would trickle down to practical things, like what people are taught about the nature of reality, and also for our healing systems, but none of that happened. So No, it just became cell phones. (laughs) That's right. So we have this ridiculous situation where because of interest of the pharmaceutical industry and other type of vested interests that control money supply and control basically legislation, we still are dealing with a medicine that is way over 100 years old that has not partaken in the quantum revolution in physics whatsoever because of the profit motive and patenting a particular chemical and selling that to you that you have to take for the rest of your life, which is a very effective profit engine, but not very effective as uh, integrating the steps forward we have today and understanding the energetic basis of the world and the energy and information that stands behind the physical body. A couple of things. For those that aren't familiar with cymatics, I think cymatics, just go on uh, any search engine and type in cymatics and then go to the videos section. You will get a very, very good description of how the invisible manifests the visible. You can see how waves of sound frequency will structure matter into geometrical forms. And it's really quite beautiful to see. And John Stuart Reed sells a cymograph, which I bought for my kids and and for Christmas and and for me. But you can sing into it and talk into it. And and then it, you know, it has a vibrating plate. So it converts that to vibration. You can actually see your own voice. So you can chant OM or you know, anything you want to say or chant into it, and it'll give you the the immediately takes the little powder that you put on there and turns it into the geometrical shapes that are coming out of you, which really I like because for children and, and for adults, it shows you, which the ancients have told us forever, the power of your voice to create reality. And what's behind your voice, your thoughts, which are even more subtle. And your thoughts and your emotions. So you can use a cymograph like that to realize that you're actually contributing to the creation of existence if with every thought and word. Two other things. My studies on scalar energy, it, it seems to me to be very much in line with zero point energy and it's non-local. Where does where do you feel the scalar energy fits within the model you've just described from the electromagnetic below to the physical, the etheric, the uh, lower mental, higher mental, astral, causal, or however you want to break that down. So I think that the way it ended up being used, and that leads to some of the confusion we have today, because really discussing the different ways people are using the term scalar gets very, very involved. But the foundation of it is that scalar is simply a scientific term indicating Something has a magnitude of energy, but we have no indicated trajectory or vector line of movement of that in the physical plane. That's all scalar really means. So if you give something like a weight of something, like this thing weighs X number of pounds, that's a scalar type of measurement because it has magnitude, but it doesn't tell you 
is, is it going anywhere? It's not like I'm saying this car is going 60 miles per hour at a northeast trajectory. It has both a, a magnitude, in this case speed, and also a place that it's going. So with scalar measurements, whether it's you know weight or length or something like that, it's just giving you one particular aspect of it. It's giving you the magnitude of the energy or energy field, but it's not telling you that it's having a particular activity with motion on the physical plane. Once you add in the directionality, now it goes from being a scalar measurement to a vector measurement. This is just basic, you know, science 101 type stuff. But we need to understand where that term scalar comes from. Because lots of times people, when they talk about scalar, they don't really understand the very simple scientific basis of it. But scalar became the catch-all for discussing energies that were not what uh, Nikola Tesla referred to as the retarded Hertzian waves that we examine today in electromagnetic theory. And so there's the understanding that, number one, the quantum vacuum, the empty space, holds tremendous energetic charge that many people had to do experiments to be able to tap into that type of field. But there's also the aspects of dealing not with the decayed electromagnetic energy that's below the level of the physical. It's literally the decay process for the biological life force above the physical. But there is the actual chi, ki, prana, ether, biological life force that is theoretically faster than the speed of light and works on some different principles than electromagnetic energy does. And so when they would find these anomalous things energetically, one way to refer to it would be as scalar waves, something that's more related to, at this vitality level, this core energy that gets constructed geometrically to become the literal energy template that when crystallized will become whatever physical form. Then when people begin to work the scalar concept, they want to individualize it a little bit more. They'll give it some other name based on what functions they're focusing on. So for example, the Russian work with torsion waves. With torsion waves, they discovered that there are certain ways that energy moves that doesn't quite line up with what we think about electromagnetic energy that has to do with these types of spiral movements, which, if you really understand them, are vortex movements, how energy is in a vortex. And on top of that, they found that these energies affect the movement of time and that you can create distortions in time based on torsion waves. And so this is a, just an example of how you get the scalar concept and you tweak it a little bit, you give it a new name, and then zero point energy. Now, zero point energy is often connected to this whole idea. And I'm giving a very simplistic gloss here. If you're dealing with people that are very deep in the subject, they say, well, that's very simple. Well, my purpose right now is to... Well, that's, that's good <laughs> for the podcast. That's right. I'm trying to keep it fairly simple. So the zero point energy is something that is coming from a zero point. And so this relates to the idea of the quantum vacuum, but it also relates to something about beyond the three dimensions of physical space, there's something else. If we can go into that zero point, then there's all types of infinite energy and potentially a gateway to higher dimensional energetic fields. And so we have aspects of modern physics today that deal with the concept of things like 10 dimensions, not just a three-dimensional space, but to make some of the equations in physics work out. They have to have like 10 different dimensions. And then when somebody Yeah, says, like string theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then when somebody says, oh, well, this shows that we live in a multidimensional universe and metaphysical things, they say, no, 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 no. The mathematics requires 10 dimensions, but don't ever think that means there's anything beyond the physical plane of the three dimensions. And you say that doesn't even make sense, but it's so deeply indoctrinated in education today. When I got my, my PhD in international studies, a very wise professor said to me, uh, do you know what uh, the PhD really is? And I knew he had something good, so I just said, no, what is it? And he said, the PhD is your reward for accepting the myths of your profession. <laughs> exactly. And I thought, oh, that's okay. You know what's going on here. This is, this is good. So <laughs> one other thing with zero-point energy I want to bring in is that if you think about a zero-point, you're really talking about a center, the center of something. Because in geometric theory, in a three-dimensional world, the zero dimension is a point. But it's an immaterial point. It's like it has no magnet, it has no movement out in space. 
It's an immaterial uh, point that is has no length, breadth, depth. And then you have the first movement to create the, the length, and then the second dimension to create the, the breadth, and then the third movement to create the depth. Now you've got the three axes of physical space. That's what's used in electromagnetic theory to identify vector lines of the movement of energy. And so this whole idea of zero-point energy and this infinite energy that surrounds us everywhere that Nikola Tesla was also very interested in is something that I think connects very deeply to biogeometry developed by our friend Dr. Ibrahim Karim from Cairo, Egypt. Because uh, when I train people in biogeometry, one of the first things to communicate to them is that this is all about connecting to the universal harmonizing energy that is not polarized. It's from the one. It's from the original unified field state where everything is one, which means there's not too much yin. There's not too much yang. It's all in the center. Everything is harmonized and balanced. It's the equilibrium point for all types of biological systems. And so it's been an absolutely paradigm shifting development, what Dr. Kareem has developed in biogeometry with the idea that we can literally tap into the energy in the center of anything and use that to harmonize and balance living energy fields. That's the core of biogeometry. And then we have different ways we can train people to be able to test this and apply it and things of this kind. So this then starts to bring us, if we understand the phenomena, and that's what I'm trying to do now is explain like the core of these terms and the phenomena, which otherwise can be very confusing for people, that it's actually connected to things like the practical applications of biogeometry. And in the ancient world, they would have understood what we're doing today in biogeometry for the teachings inside the ancient Egyptian temple system. And so now back to Heisenberg, we're rediscovering in a new frame of reference some of the information and techniques used in the ancient spiritual traditions. Hello, everybody. After countless requests, I'm super excited to announce our How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online training program. This program is designed specifically for anyone that wants to learn how to eat, move, and be healthy and is perfect as a learning opportunity for the whole family. In my 40 years as a holistic health practitioner, I've always been saddened and amazed that there is no real basic health training in our education systems that teaches people how to care for their body and enjoy the freedom that only health can give. Anyone will be able to follow my How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online and learn many ways to apply what I share in my book. And to give you even more support, this offer includes a free How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy ebook to help reinforce your learning process. In fact, if you've not yet read my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you can take this special six-week How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy online training program and get instant coaching on how you, your family, and friends can look and feel your best. You will not only learn from me personally, but you will learn from Angie Check, Head of Holistic Lifestyle Coaching at the Czech Institute, Matthew Walden, Head of Education for the Czech Institute, and Joe Rushton, who is a Czech Institute instructor and certified chef. All our presenters in this course are highly skilled and add tremendous value to this excellent training program. How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy Online will be available as of January the 9th. This course is $495, but as a Living 4D listener, you get a special launch discount of 40% off and can make three payments of $99. Again, you get a free How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy ebook to help you look and feel your best and support your learning with the online training program. This offer is only available until January the 31st. Take advantage of this incredible offer and get started creating the new you. Go to C-H-E-K dot, so C-H-E-K, the word C-H-E-K lowercase, dot group forward slash capital L number four D dash E-M-B-H. Once again, that's C-H-E-K dot group forward slash L number four D dash E-M-B-H. I have received countless letters from people around the world about how they healed many things that ailed them and how they look and feel better and have much more energy. And many mothers told me that how to eat, move, and be healthy has been a miracle for their children too. 
Enjoy this opportunity to make your 2024 a year of health, vitality, and enjoy a new level of freedom that you have never had before. I did a podcast with a man named Tom Palladino, who uses the scalar energy field to broadcast a variety of different types of healing frequencies. And before I did the podcast with him, I wanted to make sure I tested it because, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff can be gimmicky, but I definitely noticed a difference. And, um, he had, he has them, uh, different programs for allergies and a variety of different things. I think he just gave me and, and Angie and the kids like his core package, but when he turned it on, I felt the best way I could describe it is like an expansion of my core energy. It felt like I'd been doing Tai Chi for a half an hour, but it just stayed. And it was just like, I don't know, kind of an invigorating, not by any means uh, buzzy or agitating. A sense of, of energetic support would be the best way I could describe it because there's not really words to kind of categorize some of these things. So I just bring that up because we talk about scalar energy and he, he actually produced his own scalar wave uh, generator that broadcasts non-locally so he can treat people all over the world from his location. So I thought that was an interesting concept. What, before we move on, I may have asked this before, but this is one of those things that I think doesn't get explained very well. And we've used this word many times now. There's a lot of different uses of the word dimension. You've got length, width, depth, time. That's the four-dimensional world we live in. But if you study the work of Chris Hardy and the infinite spiral staircase theory, which is excellent, she talks about the SIG dimension, which, which is the dimension of meaning or consciousness. Then you've got all the dimensions of string theory. You've got raw and the law of one. They talk about first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh type dimensions. Could you please put some structure to the concept of what a dimension is? Because there's so many different ways. Like I could go in my library right now and pull out ten books all using the word dimension <laughs> that all have different they all they all have different models oh, yeah. from Barbara Hand Clough to Cynthia Dale to the list is long. How do we understand the, when, when the word dimension is used in this context, particularly when we're getting past length, width, depth, and time, what exactly is a dimension from your perspective? So again, just from my perspective, a dimension is a particular aspect that we can pull out of the larger totality of any system. And so people often use the term dimensions to mean different slices of a system, different facets of it that can be understood and explored so we can begin to understand the whole system. There's a great statement by the great Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian teacher, Rudolf Steiner, where he says, to understand anything in its totality, you have to essentially, in consciousness, walk a circle around it and see it from 12 different perspectives. And that's why we have, in our system understood by the ancients, we have 12 signs of the zodiac around the earth. They are 12 cosmic powers. They are 12 cosmic perspectives. They are 12 cosmic trajectories that alchemical systems can go on. And then you see that reflected in things like 12 disciples around the Christ, these types of things. So dimensions are aspects of the system. So some one person uses it and they're using it to describe the different aspects of the physical system, that the physical plane is defined by three 90 degree angles. So those are three different dimensions, uh, one to another. And then, you know, Einstein adds in the fourth dimension being time. Then they've changed that in modern quantum physics, where you have like string theory with at least 10 dimensions and all of these kinds of things. And then people will often talk about dimensions in terms, as we mentioned a moment ago, just in terms of aspects of a system. I tend to use the term dimension as being somewhat synonymous with the concept of planes. So you have the concept of spiritual or planes of nature in classical systems, which are the different parts of the system. And so just as I have a physical body, and that's all that's understood and accepted by modern materialistic science and medicine, you then have the energetic body and then 
what gets reflected in the emotional, mental structures, the causal, the spiritual, and then back to one with the divine. I think of that as being dimensionality. Because when I, I work with people on becoming aware of these dimensions inside of yourself, these planes inside of yourself, that's what creates what's called the subtle bodies or the koshas, the sheaths, or the spirit that they describe in the Himalayas. And so we can actually experience them inside of ourselves. And there is like a change from one dimension to another as you go through it. When you experience yourself completely in the physical body, it's different than experiencing yourself in the energetic body. When you move to experiencing yourself in the energetic body, you're experiencing things through vibration, tingling, pressure, hot and cold, things like this. Then as you move up to the next level beyond that, the astral level, moving toward the emotional and mental function, we perceive things in terms of light and color. And then there's other experiences we have on other other levels. So that's the way that, that I think of dimensions. In my own use of it, I tend to think in terms of it as being somewhat synonymous with the planes model, because these are different levels of function, and they relate incredibly deeply to what every human being experiences, their lived reality, and their ability to, to develop themselves to a higher level. So that's anyway, that's my take on it. Yeah, it's important because, I, you know, it can be confusing for people. Uh, and I've looked up definitions of def definitions in a lot of different books. And some of you, even some of the definitions don't line up with each yeah, other. Yeah. But one of the descriptions I studied uh, not too long ago on a dimension, I'm just paraphrasing it. Basically, it was saying a higher dimension is something that basically allows a lower dimension to exist. But at the lower dimension, you're not aware of the higher dimension. And I thought, well, that, that, that's a good description. Um, you know, there's a lot of things above us that we aren't aware of that allow us to exist that we're not aware of. Yes. Uh, it may not apply to every way that people are using the term dimension, but it certainly is a useful and valid perspective in and of itself. And in many cases, it would apply. Yes. It just helps you perceive, you know, they, they gave an example for, uh, I can't remember what the example was, but it's something like if you lived in two dimensions, there could be a third dimension, but you wouldn't even know it was exactly, there. Exactly. The, the flat land idea. If you're in flat land, all you see is the 2D world. You don't know there's a third dimension. If a sphere came down into your 2D world, you would see a point that's growing out in an arc. And if you walked around it, you'd see a circle, but you wouldn't see the, the thing that's actually creating it as a three-dimensional object moving through that plane. This is the classic flatland concept, yes. Yeah, the person that wrote what I was reading said, the problem is if you were a two-dimensional being, you wouldn't even know to look up. <laughs> exactly, because there would be no up. You don't, you don't know yeah. up exists. And the exact same thing is, I, I love the flatland concept because it so pertains to what's happened in modern science and medicine that they don't even yes. know to look up that they have such a restricted view of only the physical plane and brought in electromagnetics because they had to, but they don't accept anything above it, even though we're constantly drawn to it, even in very practical things. Like, you know, if somebody gets cancer, cancer can come from many different causes, but there's certainly a tremendous amount of evidence coming from things like the new German medicine by Hamer, showing that the emotional state of a person can be very linked to the development of cancer. And that there's even what's called the cancer personality. Now that's what we, we thought of in modern medicine as a higher dimension that they would never take into account. They don't, they never ask you about your emotional state. They'll take a bunch of physical tests and test different types of glands and secretions. But, you know, there's always that aspect of the higher levels we don't even know to look at. And the classic spiritual traditions really give us that gift of showing us these multiple levels to be able to be conscious of and see how they affect every other level. Well, I think you're being a little bit polite toward the medical community <laughs> yeah. because you're saying they don't even know to look up, but I'll prove to you that you're being polite. They know to look up because they know who to censor and who to wipe out and who to destroy and whose books to burn. So they already know that they just don't want you to look up. And that's the same of any fundamentalist cult, right? Is that they, <laughs> yes. are, they know what books to burn. To, to like yes. try to protect their their castles in the sky that they've created, and they 
they rely on for their authority and their income. Yeah, we can talk to, we, we, I'm sure Mr. Reich knows all about this. Absolutely. <laughs> Wilhelm Reich's work is so significant. And like so many other people, he got squashed for trying to move things forward. Trying to help people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's illegal to help people. When we were talking, I think you talked about the LD50 in the last podcast, but I wanted to see if you could just maybe retouch on that. But what, what can we learn from that? Because that I think that's a very important concept. Uh, maybe you can talk about that, just a recap of that, why that's important, and, and what can we take away from that that's relevant to, to the issues of the world today, be it drugs, whatever, however you want to help us land it in reality today. The LD50 concept is just a basic concept of modern toxicology, which is LD50 means lethal dose 50. It is the dose of any toxin that will kill 50% of those it is given to. And so that's like the this median measurement of how much of this toxin will kill half the, in this case, people that it's applied to. Now, the thing that always struck me when I we discussed this in toxicology in my work as a Marine Corps nuclear biological chemical warfare defense instructor was that, you know, if things were purely materialistic, that LD50 measurement would basically be based only on something completely physical. It'd only be based on something like, let's say, body weight. Because we can understand that the amount of toxin that could kill a person that is 100 pounds might be smaller than the amount of toxin it would take to kill a person who's 350 pounds. That'd be a very simple, mechanical, physical concept. But it doesn't work that way. In reality, you can have a 100-pound person survive an LD50 dose that kills a 350-pound person. You know, it's not simply a matter of the physical aspect of it at all. And so this was something that I thought about for years, like, why is it that some people survive and some people don't? And then you could go into things like, well, they had certain compromised organ systems, and so they were more susceptible to this. They didn't have the level of the immune system functioning. Yeah, okay. But I think it really comes to what we're going to get into in a minute, which is it has to do with the energetic construction of the biological energy field of the person. That's the core life energy. And again, classical traditions like Chinese medicine, they're all about this. So you have a certain level of qi, a certain level of the the kind of dynamic life force that you burn all the time like gasoline. And then you have a certain level of jing. And jing is their term for the core densified life force in the body, of which we have a particular more limited aspect. So whereas the the chi concept is somewhat like the gasoline, you have to keep taking in, taking in the energy that's in the air, the energy that's in the liquid you drink, the energy that's in the food you eat. That's something that has to be replenished. And the quality of your lifestyle, the quality of your food, etc., contributes to that. But the jing is like what you were born with, with the core densified life force. And some people are born with more than others based on the circumstances of their birth and their mother and things like that. But it kept being very clear to me that there are aspects of this that relate to these higher planes, higher dimensions, of the way a person's mind works, their level of mind power, their level of emotional energy, their level of dynamic life force at the vitality level. These are things that play in all the time to practical health outcomes and are considered to be completely non-analyzable or even to be even considered in modern Western medicine. They have no concept for these things whatsoever. It has to be just purely mechanical measurements. And of course, this concept of purely mechanical measurement starts to go out the window, not only when you're dealing with LD50 and why did this person survive and this person didn't, but it also comes into play as we deal with things like biogeometry. So that Dr. Kareem was, when we, we talked before about some of the incredible research projects Dr. Kareem has done successfully. So if he could grow sweet potatoes in salt water 
coming from the Red Sea without taking any salt out of the water. If you just give that salt water straight to a growing sweet potato, it will die. But if you give it the salt water with all the salt still present, but you change the vibrational characteristics of the water in the way that we teach in biogeometry, you can give that salt water with all the salt still in it to the sweet potato and it'll grow better than if it was given fresh water. And it's things like this, and you can find all kinds of examples of this in, in what is thrown out by modern science and medicine because it doesn't fit our paradigm, so we're not even going to look at it. But it shows that the vibrational, the energetic characteristics are primary. The chemical characteristics are secondary. It doesn't mean the chemicals don't have an effect. They will certainly do something. Well, the energetic vibration is with the chemical too. That's right. But it also supersedes, like in this case with the salt water, it supersedes the impact of the salt because according to modern science, the only thing that matters in that case is how saline the water is and how much salt is present. They would never say we could give the salt still in the water and nourish a plant by changing vibrational characteristics of the water. That doesn't exist in their paradigm. But in fact, Dr. Kareem proved that that was the case. Yes, that's beautiful too. Now, when it comes to what you were talking about, you were using the word Jing. Rudy Vespor, who I've done several podcasts with, a very skilled homeopathic and very also schooled in Steiner's work. Are you familiar with Rudy at all? I am not. Oh, I, I got to connect you with him. He's He's a deep guy. If you listen to any of my podcasts with him, they're fantastic. But he talks about the difference between our the energy we re- use for routine and ritual, you know, our functional energy, the way we carry things out, do things, eat, breathe, exercise. And and he separates that type of life force from generational uh, energy, which is the regenerative energy, our healing capacity. And he says that not all of us are born with the same level of generative energy and that some people can't recover from diseases because their generative energy is too low. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because spiritual practices, especially things like Tai Chi, Qigong, there's a number of them, as you know, you can actually say say you're born from fairly weak stock. You know, you don't have a good constitution. Mom and dad were not really the fittest or the most vital. Maybe there's a history of a lot of disease in the family. But people like that, that engage a legitimate practice of Tai Chi, Qigong, medical Qigong. Meditation can help, but it's not really a generative pra- practice like Qigong or Tai mm-hmm. Chi is. Exactly. But they they can, I know, you know, I haven't missed a day of work in over 42 years due to illness at all. I get something, I'll get a runny nose, I'll fight it off, but it doesn't knock me down. I just like, okay, something's trying to get me and I just do the right things. And, it's, and, I, and I spent my, you know, my whole life doing these practices. So I know for sure. And, I, and I've given them to thousands of people. I've taught thousands and thousands of people this. So I've watched people going from being sick all the time to being healthy, vital people. The point I'm bringing up is I think it's important for people to realize that no matter what hand of cards you were dealt, you can improve the hand by getting involved in the right practices. And all these practices, even Tai Chi, it's not just a physical practice. It's a, a practice of learning to use your mind, you know, and, and not, shall we say, waste your core energy on creating thoughts that ultimately and feelings that are degenerative in, in and of themselves, like we were talking about in the beginning. That's why I said you get a cymoscope, you can see what your voice creates. So it's just a, a comment to let people know you can build these core life force energies and create more stability for yourself. Uh, this this concept also comes up in things like classical traditions like Chinese medicine, because they'll discuss the prenatal energies, which is very much connected to the concept of the Jing in Chinese medicine and to the generative energies that your friend was discussing. That would be the prenatal energies. And then you have the postnatal energies. After you're born, what do you do to generate the energy? So this is where we're dealing with then and what you were discussing about how we use our mind, how we use our emotions, these kinds of things. These are part of a set of planes that interpenetrate. And so we can reduce the amount of vital life force in the body through the thoughts that we think, or we can increase the vital life force through the thoughts that we think. Same thing with our emotional function, etc. 
And what we tap into spiritually at the higher levels above that, that can also vitalize us energetically or it can weaken us energetically, depending on what we are connected to. So all these levels come together to be able to, whatever hand you're dealt, like you're saying, whatever hand you're dealt with the the background level of vitality that you have, it can be taken further through the correct use of the mind, the emotions, the life force energy itself. And another thing you touched on is that certain types of meditative work don't actually generate more of this life force in the body. Now, there's something very interesting in the work of Rudolf Steiner, where he he goes as far as to say that if you look at these major structures in the body, so we have the head, which is the foundation of our normal consciousness. Then we have the lungs and the heart, and we have the energy in the chest. This upper structure with our consciousness would be called the upper elixir field in Chinese medicine and Taoism. Taoism. Yeah. yeah. Then you've got the middle elixir field with the energies in the center with the heart and the lungs and feeling function is a part of it, emotions, love. And then for the lower dantian and the lower abdomen, this is directly connected to the vital life force itself. So Steiner brings out that thinking is actually a death process. So if you look at the, the greatest scientist in the world, these guys don't look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right? They're not like big muscle men. They're not big vital guys. And some of them have fought themselves to death. Yeah, absolutely. Because deep thinking burns up life energy in the body. It, you're literally burning it all the time when you're thinking deeply. And so if we have a thing that we just want to be physically burly and impressive, then the people that pursue that in their life often don't pursue quantum physics or some other really deep type of thing because they're two different polarities. So we have the thinking, which allows us to expand in all kinds of ways, but it will burn up the vital life force in the body. And then you have the development of the vital life force with the practices we do with the lower abdomen. So this includes all types of generative energies, including with the Qigong and Tai Chi, also the sexual forces in the body, all these types of things. These actually generate the life force. This burns up the life force. So there are two opposite polarities that then get harmonized through the effects of the middle dantian, the heart. You're talking about, if I'm correct in what what I think you're talking about from Steiner's perspective, you're talking about his concept of rhythm man, metabolic man, and, and limb man, aren't you? Yes. So he talks about the nerve sense system as being up here. And then you have the rhythmic system with the heart and the lungs here. That's all based on the rhythm of the pulsation. And then you've got the the life force energy, the will forces, the metabolic forces, the metabolic limb forces that allow you to move your limbs and move in space coming from the lower abdomen. And so that becomes the divisions for anthroposophic medicine coming out of Central Europe. So we can actually understand this also as a physiological healing system, which is what the anthroposophical medicine is. Yeah, I have all this Steiner's concepts built into Czech life process alchemy. Sometime I've got to show you the system of alchemy I developed. I think you'd find it fascinating because uh, you'd actually be able to see right into it. I just haven't tried to burden you with more to look at because I know how busy you are. But but someday I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. I think I'll just email you the master diagram because as soon as you see it, it'll be obvious to you. But it's, it's very powerful and very effective. I've helped a lot of people heal. Now, we've touched on some of the issues of the next point of discussion here. Now, there's the, the growing energy and vibrational medicine aspects of healing, which has also been heavily suppressed, as you know, and Luke Montagnier's research and, and even on brain farting on the guy that was one of the original scientific researchers on uh, homeopathy, the French scientist that they tor- tortured to death. Benavista or something? Benavista, like yeah, Jacques Benavista. Oh, yeah. You know, his research was showing that you don't need to buy drugs. So they trashed him, which was sad because he was a highly celebrated scientist and they just ruined his career as quickly as they could, except for guys like me and you that are smart enough to see through it. Do you want to talk about any of these other aspects? Because you've yes. got longitudinal waves, transverse <laughs> waves. Yeah. Uh, Share what you think is important for us to expand our understanding of what would be maybe in the realm of quantum physics 
or subtle energy medicine, but that we should all be aware of. And particularly if you can orient yourself towards how and why that's important today, because I think as a side note, a lot of these technologies are being used against us. They're being used for negative purposes, such as information fields, broadcasting information fields to control people's minds, uh, which I won't sidetrack the conversation, but I've looked into that and I've used remote viewing and seen some very interesting things that were quite disturbing as to what technologies are being used against us. So anything that you want to share in this regard because it goes right to homeopathics and all sorts of important things. So what would you like us to know? Let's look at some data points to, to heal our paradigm of, of <laughs> how all this works together. Let's do that. <laughs> so uh, just touching very briefly on some very important things. Uh, the work of Alexander Gurevich in Russia, where 100 years ago, he was able to demonstrate that there are energetic emanations from living beings that affect other living beings. So we'd work with something like a growing onion. And we know just like, uh, this is like folk knowledge that's been developed for thousands of years, that they say, oh, if you have like a bunch of garlic and one garlic is starting to sprout, the other garlics will start to sprout too. Now, Gerbich was able to demonstrate that there actually is a type of ultraviolet radiation that comes from living beings that affects the life functions of other living beings. So for example, when you have a group of women living together and they all start to synchronize their periods, how does that happen? There's no physical exchange between them that's making it happen. It's not on a physical level. Obviously, something's happening on an energetic level. But, and so what Gervich was able to identify are these weak ultraviolet emanations and that's just with what he could pick up with his equipment. There was no doubt other energetic emanations he did not have equipment to detect, but he could detect the weak ultraviolet emanation that led to like the growing stems of the onion would have biological effects on other onions and how they grew based on the radiation coming out of it. And so he talked about this mitogenetic radiation, which is a type of biological life force where one biological life force affects another. And his work is absolutely fascinating. It sort of changed biology completely. But of course, they try to ignore all that. And so what then happened is around the, I think it was in the 1970s, there was the work of Kaznachev in Russia. And our access to this is through a book by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Bearden that is called The Excalibur Briefing. I highly recommend it to everybody. Very interesting book. And he talks about and he gives the reference that this comes from, of this Russian research with Kaznachev, where he took this further. And so we know that quartz, quartz crystal, will allow a full spectrum of energy to pass through it, including the ultraviolet. But we know that ordinary glass will cut off parts of the spectrum, particularly in the ultraviolet range. So what he did is he had a particular toxin in a Petri dish that he separated with no possibility of any air movement or cross-contamination, completely sealed off from one another. And he had a Petri dish with a, a particular biological toxin in it, and then another Petri dish that didn't have the biological toxin. And he would separate them through glass, separated through the glass where you couldn't get the movement of that ultraviolet radiation. The second Petri dish that didn't have the pathogen didn't have any issues. But when he separated them with a quartz window, which does allow that electromagnetic radiation within the ultraviolet range and no doubt things beyond the electromagnetic as well to pass through the quartz window, then you actually have the development of the exact same disease that was in the first Petri dish appear in the second Petri dish, meaning it was broadcast energetically. Yeah. Now, this is the kind of stuff that people get in trouble for just talking about. But this is the way things work. So and we know from, and again, this was Russian research. They're following up on Gurbich. And they're saying, well, if we can send things that affect the growth and reproduction of living forms, things that may be related to health, can we send things that are related to illness and death through this type of energetic transmission? And the answer, for good or for ill, was yes, we can. And so that was already known in research in the 1970s. Again, go to Tom Bearden's book, Excalibur Briefing, for more description and to find the original citations. 
So with that being the case, that we actually can have an energetic projection of energy fields that create health or illness, that gave rise to my term of waves of health and illness, which was also taken up uh, in a separate body of work with the French researchers in radiesthesia, the ability to detect subtle radiations and to apply these subtle radiations that occurred in France in the early 1900s and is actually the foundation of what is modern biogeometry out of Egypt with Dr. Ibrahim Karim. So uh, I created an online class called the Universal Vibrational Spectrum that goes into the French research that identified all of these different qualities of energy that can are and are projected energetically, invisibly, all the time from living beings. And in the online course, Universal Vibrational Spectrum, I created on this. I think it's the first time there's been any real summary. I couldn't find it in the French works, although they did all the foundation work. I actually summarized what's the effects of all these different qualitative bands of energy that biological beings are broadcasting all the time at the physical, energetic, emotional, mental, and spiritual levels. It's just a beginning in this field, but it actually gives you something to work with there. Because the French were able to detect and differentiate these subtle energies coming from biological beings. Then Dr. Karim, building on the French work, because the French always said the people that knew the most about what they called shape-caused waves, because these types of energy waves can be broadcast from shapes, sounds, colors, motions, angles, proportions, number series, all kinds of things. They said that the people that knew the most about this in the ancient world were the ancient Egyptians. And so Dr. Karim, a modern Egyptian, came in as an absolute genius and took the French work, connected it to the old French knowledge, and created biogeometry. And it's an incredible system. And with it, we can actually detect all those different invisible qualities of energies. And we need to understand that this, though, allows us to test the specific energy components that we have the general idea in modern metaphysics that every thought that you have has an energy quality that you broadcast out of your energy field. Every emotion you have has an energy quality that you broadcast out of your energy field all the time. We are all resonating antennas of the quality that we are generating in our life force field that we are having our feelings, that we have in our emotions, that we have in our thoughts. We're projecting it outward all the time. And that's why people feel comfortable with one person and not comfortable with another person. What this person is projecting out dynamically is something you may or may not want to be around. So looking at these foundations and then moving forward, we can begin to see, okay, well, if this is the case that we have these invisible vibrations that may be beyond what Tesla in a derogatory way referred to as our modern electromagnetic theory with retarded Hertzian waves, and there's something beyond that, these scalar waves, which we could also think of to some degree as biological energy waves that cannot be easily picked up or detected or analyzed by standard electromagnetic equipment. It's simply too subtle that we can see that there's other things that occur in modern science that have not been clearly defined as their significance. And the average person doesn't even know that they exist. So for example, uh, quantum physics says that particles come from the collapse of the wave function. And so, okay, so if things are prim primarily waves and have an energetic basis, they're not a solid thing, but they can collapse into a solid thing based on the geometric structure of the field that as a programs it for the, the thing it's going to do, that we say, okay, well, what are the types of waves that are understood in modern science? So two of the most fundamental types of waves are going to be the longitudinal wave and the transverse wave. Now, this can be made to be very full of jargon and very hard to follow, so I'm going to make it super simple. So what we have as a standard electromagnetic wave, the way we think of it today, is, is called a transverse wave. It's transverse because with the propagation of the electrical component, you have then a displacement of energy at 90 degrees to the direction of travel. And that's the classic thing that we know today about the 90 degree rule, where people in electrical engineering will hold their hands like this. You have up and down, uh, front and back, side to side. 
that creates the three axes, the three dimensions of physical space. And so with the transverse waves, we know that when electrical current is moving through a wire at a 90 degree angle to it, we'll get the magnetic component. That's a absolutely standard for electromagnetic theory. If I can just interject uh, something simple for people that they may not be aware of that points this out, all plants and trees follow the electric field toward the sun, but the magnetic field wraps itself around the earth. So there you see that 90 degree angle. Trees are growing up straight out of the ground, right toward the sun. The sun literally has a levitational type energy, but the electric field that's going vertically is 90 degree angle to the magnetic field. Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable, and I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn, and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. To try Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash C-H-E-K 15. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y dot com forward slash C-H-E-K 15. No promo code is required. Enjoy. Whenever you have a moment where it fits, I have a couple of quick comments okay, and, a, so, and a book to share. Okay. So let me finish up the, the concept yeah. here. So most people have some idea of this transverse wave. Now, one way that these transverse waves express themselves is literally through light. That's a, that's a transverse wave. Then we have another type of wave that's known to science that's called a longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave doesn't displace things at 90 degrees to its own line of travel. It displaces things to travel parallel to it. So transverse waves are perpendicular. The longitudinal waves, parallel. Now, the example you always see in scientific text to describe a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. And so if we understand this, then okay. So if we look at this the way people are taught in school, all we are taught is the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So there's a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that creates what we pick up in a range as sound waves. That's in a different part of the linear chart that we're all taught of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. That's in a different part, different frequency range than those waves that we pick up with our eyes in terms of light and color. And so it's presented as this kind of, of linear uh, analysis and we would think, oh, well, there, it's all the same. It's just a question of what is the frequency. But in fact, we now know it doesn't work that way. There's some more complications to it. There's, there's more depth in nature's design language than they told us in school. Because the way the sound waves move and create energy around it is completely opposite to the way that the light moves and creates movements around it. So, But nobody talks about this. And nobody talks about this even in metaphysical healing circles. We talk in abstract ways about there's sound healing and there's healing with light and color, both systems that I absolutely love. But we have to see that they are two separate systems working with two different types of waves. When we move into a future paradigm that is far more enlightened than what we have today, where we're going to be using energies for healing, we're going to understand that these are two different types of waves we can use for healing. And the effect of the sound waves may not be identical to the effect of the light and color waves. Not that one is better than the other, but they're part of a more complex picture. So if we think of the human being as being an energetic system, 
there's going to be certain healing opportunities, I believe, that we get from the application of the longitudinal waves and sound waves, particularly with the cymatics. Because I totally agree with you that the cymatics demonstrates perfectly the way that invisible energy waves will structure matter, that the form of matter is an epiphenomenon of the energy of the wave. The wave is causative. The the shape of the physical object is an effect that comes from the cause. And so that's what you see all the time in cymatics, that as you're putting that sound frequency through a paste or a powder or something like that, with one sound frequency, it forms up physical matter into a specific shape, change the sound frequency, it gives the physical matter a completely different shape. This is the solution to how all physical forms get their shape. It comes from the waves. And so if we understand that, now there's a very powerful growth from the cymatic research called cymotherapy with my friend Mandara Cromwell carrying on the work of Dr. Peter Guy Manners. And they have incredibly advanced very useful sound healing technology that uses a combination of specific sound waves to recreate the core frequency information that creates all these biological functions in the body. And then you have all the the light and color therapies today, which also include electromagnetic therapies, the way we commonly describe them, that includes microcurrent therapy that goes along with the light and color therapies that are transverse waves, and that can also be incredibly powerful. So I just wanted to get up to this point, introduce what's coming later. I'll turn it over to you here in a second, uh, just to show a, a progression of concepts that lead us to where today we have practical technologies of healing that are extremely non-invasive, incredibly biologically active, dealing with longitudinal waves, sound healing, and transverse waves, light and color, and microcurrent. So I'll turn it back over to you because you said you had some some comments and uh, a book to recommend. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. You know, we're talking about the collapse of the wave function and invisible becoming visible, cymatics. You know, here's a real practical example of the collapse of the wave function. It's your thoughts that drive your posture and your gesture. 55% of all language is nonverbal. It's posture and gesture. But you can't see your thoughts, right? And and your thoughts are actually more waves than they are anything else. And and even though they see them on an electroencephalogram, that's that's another trick because they think, oh, look, we can see your thoughts. No, you're seeing the effects of the thoughts. The brain is responding. It would be like saying, look, my oscillograph, oscilloscope is going up and down, so I'm seeing the electricity. Well, you're seeing the effects of the electricity on the device that you're using. And it's designed to give you that wave because that's how it's constructed, just like your brain is constructed to receive these non-local thought waves that manifest. You know, Steiner says thoughts are spirit. And we don't have, you know, well, biogeometry can measure spirit, but we don't have standard uh, technical devices to measure spirit. And another thought that I wanted to share is that your intention collapses the wave function. What you intend takes pure potential and turns it into actuality. So I, I, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I love that. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, that's why I tell my students, you must understand what the word intention means because God is zero. God is neutral. God is unconditional love, if you want a simple. So the zero force is all possibilities are available to you, pure potential. So the word intention means intention. You take potential, put it into tension, and now spirit begins to flow and manifest, which is no different than turning the dial on your tone generator and seeing what frequencies make different shapes, except you are choosing what to manifest. So the word intention means to put potential into tension, and that's why we have to pay attention to what we do with our mind. And earlier you were talking about the Russian scientist who I've studied a bunch of his work. So I'm familiar with it and read all the studies comparing what happens with quartz versus glass, which is why when I charge healing medicines, I use quartz uh, vases to carry them in because I put them in my water charger and then I direct very powerful healing crystals like Vogel cut crystals 
and I can amplify the power of anything radically. I couple it with the biogeometry charging plate. So I put the medicines on the biogeometry charging plate in a quartz, a, a, a real quartz uh, goblet. Then I direct crystals into it. And then the water charger is pumping. And then I circle it with three gallon bottles of water. So the water acts like a huge amplifier and it's wickedly powerful. But going back to that concept, there's a there's never several books I've read talking about even how throughout history it was known by people not to let a baby be held by or near unhealthy people or even people in negative emotional states because it could affect the baby so strongly it could make it sick. And so having studied torsion waves Everything that you were talking about in the ultraviolet spectrum is is real, but the torsion wave concept also could be very real. And the research I read showed that torsion waves can be measured for 30 days. For example, if I get out of this chair right now, you can actually measure a Paul Check sitting here for 30 days in the torsion field. And I know you'll know this book, but I want to let the listeners know because if you want a freaking good book that's about 800 pages of research on life force the book's called life force by claude swanson who studied biogeometry as well yes i know claude yes he was in one of angie's classes and i tried to get him on the podcast but unfortunately he passed away have you got his book life force it's fantastic it's really an amazing collection (laughs) I, yeah, I I used to read that thing in the sauna because it's so big. I said, I got to work my way through this. So every time I'd get in the sauna, I'd read a research paper. But it, from sweating on it and being in the sauna, it just disintegrated. So I bought another copy for my library. But the, some of the research in there is freaking mind-blowing. I mean, It really people, is. You read that and you realize people haven't got a fucking clue what's going on, man. It's like when you start reading some of this research that never makes it into mainstream science, and it's good research too. I mean, this isn't stuff done by, you know, hippies in Grenada. This is like seriously good research. And you're just like, oh my God, we are so fucking behind the power curve here. Where you were talking about the way that the thoughts are really waves and the brain is a receptor for it. We had mentioned before, you had brought up Michael Talbot's book on the holographic universe. There's a fantastic section in there that I never forgot when I read this decades ago, where he talked about the work of Sir John Eccles, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in brain research. And people would ask him after he won the Nobel Prize, after examining the brain for so long to find the place that ignites the firing of neurons that creates a thought, where did you find it? And he said, I found that there wasn't one. I, I found that there was a larger holographic field of energy around the human head that interacts with the head through a particular location of the brain where it takes this higher holographic field and then, in a sense, collapses it into the thoughts in the brain. And the place that he refers to, the supplementary motor area, the SMA, as the place that interacts with the holographic field and the brain, and this is from the guy that won the Nobel Prize in brain research, the supplemental motor area is the part of the brain directly beneath the crown center in the Vedic medicine work in understanding the chakras. So these things fit together absolutely perfectly. Thoughts definitely are of a non-material nature, and the brain acts as a receiver for them. So I just want to follow up on that, because that's one of my favorite things out of Michael Tabbitt's book. I think it's it's so useful. So following up on this idea then that we have different types of waves. And so I just want to say a little bit about these technologies. I'm going to be publishing on my website, vesica.org, early in 2024. Hopefully it'll be in January or soon thereafter, a type of resource guide for 2024 that tells people more about how to access these technologies and some of those I recommend and just how to understand them a little bit better. So we have the the cymatics work, which makes visible invisible waves. It's an incredible body of work. Uh, you mentioned our friend uh, John Stuart Reed, and you have his very advanced device. I want to make very clear for people that you know, sometimes you'll see like you can buy like a boom box that has like some type of thing that will show you pictures with the sound. That's just based on a computer program. It's not showing you the actual vibrational field image of that those vibrational waves. Cymatics is showing you the actual image 
that is created by those vibrational waves, like how they're created in water. They are the actual structural waves coming from that sound. Then, Dr. Peter Guy Manners, I've got a whole article about this on my website. Dr. Peter Guy Manners in Britain created Cymotherapy, where he found that if you bring together five specific uh, sound qualities together, it's called the secret of five. You can't just do one sound. It's five together. Create a composite wave that can recreate the actual vibrational field of all the major organs and biological systems in the human body based on the five waves you bring together. It's very precise. Then after he lived to be over 100, he passed on to my friend Mandara Cromwell, who now runs her Cymatech organization. And she has created the first public devices in cymotherapy that anyone can use in their own home to get these composite sound waves for healing in the body. It's one of my favorite energetic healing devices. Absolutely fantastic. Again, I've got more information on the website. Before you go to the next type of wave, I wanted to mention, I have an absolutely excellent podcast with Jonathan Goldman on sound mm. and sound in, in healing. And he recently released a, a course through uh, the Shift Network on sound healing. I mean, if you don't know who Jonathan Goldman is, he's been around for a long time. He's got a lot of amazing CDs. I listen to his work a lot when I write because it's so great for the for my mind when I'm working. But anyhow, um, I just wanted to mention for listeners, uh, Jonathan Goldman's podcast with me is excellent and uh, wonderful. I think even you would enjoy it, Robert. I mean, we oh, we, sure. get, yeah. we get we no, get down right. and we get into it. <laughs> he yeah, told me after he wrote me and said that was the deepest podcast I've ever done ever. <laughs> he said I'm I'm a, I'm amazed you wanted to talk like that that most people can't understand that. I said, well, my listeners will <laughs> like it. I, I love that. I love that. And John Stuart Reed also had a series on the Shift Network. I, I was on it as a guest presenter on Sacred Geometry. So, yeah, these guys are really deep into it. They know a lot about it. I have a podcast with John Stuart Reed, too. Oh, it's really good. It's, it's, I really like him. So we have the, the longitudinal wave. And uh, I have suspicions about longitudinal waves that I'm not ready to scientifically present just yet. But I do think the longitudinal waves may be connected to certain aspects of the biological life force in some cases that's more intimate than the connection that we have with the transverse waves but nonetheless the transverse waves are extremely powerful for healing so with the transverse waves you have not only light and color therapy which tends to be more in somewhat metaphysical holistic health circles but you also have the development of modern microcurrent therapy now again when i publish this document early 2024 on my website. I'll go into a lot more detail on this, but I just want people to be aware of the concept that tremendous research has been done in microcurrent therapy recently. So mostly when people know about certain types of electromagnetic healing devices, they think of TENS devices. TENS devices put an electromagnetic charge into the body to stop pain. And they do that by overwhelming the receptors in the body with the TENS signal uh, to stop the transmission of the pain signal. But we have to be aware that although this could be very useful for getting out of pain, it actually has a detrimental effect on the development of ATP in the body for cellular energy and also has a detrimental effect on the mitochondria because you're giving it like you're using like a sledgehammer to like knock the, the nerves to like stop transmitting the signal. And it's like kind of numb at that point. But, but you can have microcurrent therapy which is a bare fraction of the amount of juice that's going into a TENS therapy. So microcurrent is literally microcurrent. It's very, very, very tiny charges because we need to be aware that the electrical and magnetic charges in the human body are extremely small, incredibly biologically active, but very, very small. If you apply really strong electromagnetic fields to the body, it tends to be highly detrimental. Uh, but if you have very precisely engineered, correct frequency, very small inputs, it will biologically steer the body in a way that is unbelievable. It is really a, a coming. It's what medicine should be moving toward right now. It's incredible what they've been able to do. So I want to mention just a few aspects of that field. My friend, Dr. Jerry Tennant in Texas, who's written a series of books called Healing is Voltage. Healing, I've got them. Yeah, they're great. 
He's an amazing guy. He's absolutely brilliant. He's a walking testimonial to the work because he was sent home to die in his, I believe, in his 50s from a pathogen that could not be eradicated that he had picked up in his medical work. And he managed to knock it out completely. And now I believe he's, he's 80. And he's still working a full day every day. He's doing great. And he's an amazing, amazing guy. So The Healing is Voltage Works by Jerry Tennant. Go into this. And he's got brilliant observations. Uh, and he also has some of his own microcurrent devices that go with his particular healing system. Then you have the work of Carolyn McMakin, who has done, if there was any justice, that woman would have received a Nobel Prize for her work in identifying the specific frequencies that create all these different biological functions in the body. It's mind-blowing what's there. She has a fantastic book for the public called The Resonance Effect. And she has online training courses, which are pretty technical, on how to use what she calls frequency-specific microcurrent. So when you see the term FSM, or frequency-specific microcurrent, that's the work coming directly from Carolyn McMakin. And she's worked within a standard medical model. She works within standard medical circles. and But she's always had to be very careful with this work because if they, if they are too loud about what they can accomplish, then, of course, you become a target. Yeah. But they've managed to be doing this now for some decades with incredible, when you see what they've actually accomplished, it's unbelievable. But they're fairly quiet about it because we know how these things work. I highly recommend looking up frequency-specific medicine. Uh, I'm sorry, frequency-specific microcurrent, FSM, Carolyn McMakin, getting her book on the resonance effect. It's pretty stunning. And then if you are motivated to train in the system, she has online classes to learn it. But I will say it is fairly technical. And you cannot buy her devices to work on yourself unless you've done the whole training. So for that, you pretty much need to find like a practitioner unless you're really going to jump in with both feet. Then there are other makers of microcurrent devices, and I've been evaluating them and their devices. And again, that's going to be in my report that's coming out very soon in early 2024 about where people can access some more of this, this technology. But it really is an incredible work. And I wanted to give people just some of these indications of places they could start looking if they didn't want to wait for the, my article coming up that gives you more of the detail. There's a couple of other resources, I think, that are great for developmental understanding. And that's, of course, Robert O. Becker's work. Absolutely. Um, I, was I just forgot. About to go there. What's the name of his first big popular book? His, his book about the benefits of all of this is The Body Electric. Well, the Body Electric, of, yeah. His book about the dangers of it is Cross Currents. Right. And then prior to him is Harold Saxon Burr and his research oh, on, yeah. on the L field. I studied all of his books and research. That's quite informative. It's quite amazing. You know, he was a professor at Yale in 1947. Some of the research he was doing was just mind boggling. I don't even think they would let him do that research today. They probably wouldn't. But yeah, the L field research of Harold Saxton Burr really laid the foundation for a lot of this work. And it was coming out of the work before that with the Abrams device and people using in medical clinics, these electrical devices. But of course, the pharmaceutical industry came after it. They got the AMA to squash it and destroy all the devices. And this was 100 years ago. They tried to drive this back into the dark ages, but it's back. And it's fantastic what's available today if you know that it exists, which most people will never hear about. Are you familiar with Harold Saxon Burr's research that he did on water and having his college students hold uh, mason jars of water and then taking mason jars of the same tap water to psych wards and having people that were put in the hospital and locked up in psych wards hold the water and then watering the plants with it? No, but it makes perfect sense. So what was the result when they watered the plants with that? It's mind-blowing. What happened was is um, when the college students held the water and they watered plants, they grew normally. But when they watered it with the plants, same genus of plants with the water held by psychically ill people, the plants often didn't grow toward the sun. Their bodies were all gnarled and twisted. They looked like plants growing through near um, negative energy lines in the earth, ley lines with bad energy in them. Yeah, yeah. And so, or electromagnetic fields, yeah. Yes, they, the plants were very sick, and there was pictures too. But when I read that, I'm like, wow, this guy was doing this in the late 40s, and he's showing beyond a shadow of a doubt that water carries psychic energy, and it has a tremendous effect on, on plants. 
And yes. I'm like, that's very advanced research all the way back then. And hardly anybody knows about this stuff. Oh, as soon as he left Yale, they destroyed everything. That's what always happens with these cases. Jesus. But this also applies to the biogeometry work. Because again, with biogeometry, we can detect the types of energetic radiations, the subtle radiations, too subtle to be picked up by electromagnetic equipment, with the type of radiesthesia that we teach. And we can actually see that every thought a person has, every emotion a person has, is creating a vibrational quality that is projected out of their energy field, like an antenna. Yeah. So if you give that water to somebody who's mentally ill, there's going to be very detrimental energy qualities getting infused into the water because water is a fantastic holder of vibrational information. And so that experiment it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. And water's got a frequency receptive range of 65 octaves, which that's a lot of frequency range. I I got a friend of mine, Sean O'Leary, who's been on my podcast too. Father Sean O'Leary is a genius. He's a mathematician, and he he actually calculated what sixty five octaves is, and it was a number so big I don't even think there's a word for it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, that's incredible. This goes right back to the whole issue of not letting unhealthy people or negatively emotion, you know, people with dark energies hold your baby because it transfers the the psychic energy goes right into the water of their bodies. Uh, Dr. Karim has even talked about this in biogeometry, that in the ancient world, they understood that there were certain dangers with getting secondhand items. And so the Romans used to say that stones that people wear, like jewelry, will carry the sins of their owners because we'll infuse the stuff with our energies as we're, we're wearing it. But again, that's one of the incredible things about the biogeometry work. People can learn for themselves to detect these subtle energies. And you would never know by looking at it. But one particular stone will have a tremendously beneficial energy vibration coming from it. Another was worn by a sick person for a long time, and you test it and it's full of very, very toxic vibrational qualities. So the ability to perceive in the invisible world with the radiesthesia in, in biogeometry is something that is of incredible value, because now you can tell what invisible waves and what their energetic effects are in any person, place, or thing. That's really where we're moving toward. That's what I want listeners to really understand, is that we have a lot of this in place right now that they can start learning and start applying in their own lives. It's interesting, too, because when I teach Angie, my wife and I, who's a shaman, and I teach classes on sound healing, and one of the things we bring up is is for for those practicing shamanism and sound healing, is you have to make a decision as to whether you or not you want to let other people handle your your healing tools, whether it be healing wands, crystals, and stuff, because they're going to pick up other people's energies. So there's, I think it's a personal distinction, but you need to be conscious of that if you're a healer, because if someone unhealthy is handling your tools, you, you can pick up that energy. And if you're not cleaning them, uh, they can be impregnated with negative energies, even though you think you're uh, doing sound healing. And you made me think of, I read years ago, I was doing some reading on these types of things, and they brought up a comment from, a, uh, a man. I can't remember the man's name, but it was like a long time ago, maybe in the 1800s, but there was this famous wealthy person who would buy art, but he would not buy it if it had been looked at by anybody other than the artist, because he said that the it impregnated the art with the psychic energy of the people and he wanted his art to be clean and pure. So he would only buy art from the artist if nobody else had seen it. So you, you get these people from a long time ago that were very tapped in. I mean, that's pushing things to a, an extreme, but it goes to show you that these psychic energies impregnate everything around us. Absolutely. As something that, you know, what you find today is, People in holistic health and metaphysical circles who are always very concerned about what external energies could be affecting us, but we rarely ever discuss how is my weird energy potentially affecting <laughs> other people. I somehow to, we forget that. <laughs> I, I try to, we're so narcissistic. We yeah. like somehow just assume we're always perfect in the way we're affecting other people. There's other people we got to worry about. But it is something I try to bring up in all my classes is that we have to clean up our own act and make sure that what we're projecting out of our own fields is something that's beneficial to everybody. And again, through things like the biogeometry radiesthesia, we can actually very quickly and easily detect what we are broadcasting outward. 
and also pick up certain disturbances in our own energy body before they become more serious. Because it'll start as a vibrational shift before it has any physically detectable change. Hello, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying this amazing podcast. I sure am. Did you know that Bioptimizer's Microbiome Breakthrough is my daily probiotic of choice? According to research, approximately 90% of people worldwide suffer from leaky gut syndrome. This means that undigested food particles are leaking through the lining of your small intestine, overloading your liver, and putting a chronic load on your immune system. As I show in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, this is the most common reason that more people today are suffering from debilitating food intolerances than ever before. Microbiome Breakthrough not only gives you a daily dose of essential probiotics to keep your microbiome healthy, it is designed to support healing the wall of your small intestine so your liver and immune system can rest and you can digest your food effectively. Not only is this one of my all-time favorite products, it tastes great and is easy to use. To get started on Microbiome Breakthrough now and get 10% off as a Living 4D listener, go to bit.ly forward slash Microbiome Paul 10. That's B I T dot L Y forward slash Microbiome Paul 10. Enjoy your healthy gut. Well, Robert, this is all super fascinating. My next topic of discussion relates to health and illness. A lot of people think that health is considered the opposite of illness. I feel that illness and disease can be great opportunities for spiritual awakening. And before you share your thoughts on uh, the issues of illness and diseases as doorways to spiritual growth, I'd like to give credit to somebody whose work touched my life quite deeply. And I don't know if you know who she is. Are you familiar with the holistic nurse, she's long gone now, but her name was Margaret Newman. No. I think her book is Health is Health is Consciousness. But Margaret Newman was a holistic nurse who worked for 35 years to try to help hospitals understand the effects of consciousness on people's health and the importance of how nurses work with people. A, a great book. Um, I think I'll, I'll I'll get the resource for the book and I'll email it to you because it's quite good. She draws heavily on Itzhak Bentov's work mm. um, and many other people's uh, work in consciousness. Very evolved woman. But when I read her work, it really was a shift for me because she gave a number of cases talking about how she felt that illness was often as much of a gift to some people as it was a challenge because without it, they wouldn't have made the transition into becoming more conscious about what caused the illness, about doing the work to get healthy so that they can then be living examples, guides, and therapists for other people, having empathy and compassion for other people. So she really took illness out of the paradigm of the opposite of health and actually put illness almost as a category of being healthy if you deal with the illness in ways that ultimately produce health and higher consciousness. You understand what I'm saying here? Absolutely. Yes. I'm just curious on how you feel about that. Um, I think it's an important discussion to have because in our, in our culture, people want to get rid of the illness by knocking it out. They want to go pay a doctor or a therapist. And I think this applies to all this biohacking. And even sometimes these frequency devices, I mean, I'm hip to a lot of this stuff. I, you know, you know, I've studied a lot in practice. I've been around for a long time, but I think even if you can get rid of your symptoms and make yourself feel better, if you don't really get to the causative forces within yourself, you know, we're talking about thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, absolutely, uh, belief systems passed down through the family. I think you, you can feel good for a while, but you, you know, you're not really getting over it. And you can also suppress one mode of expression, say someone's got Crohn's disease, but then you use various technologies 
And it looks like it's healed, but it then comes out as some other kind of pathology because you haven't really dealt with the core energy. So love to hear you sort of share your thoughts in this regard. Okay, thank you. No, I totally agree with you on this. It's something where I believe in the ancient world, they, they definitely had a understanding that illnesses can be a reflection of things going on below the surface of the individual in a way that brings it up to consciousness where it can be addressed. And so, you know, there was a, a European book some years ago called Blessed by Illness that is working with these types of classical concepts that we will sometimes develop these illness challenges based on whatever are the issues that we have not addressed internally. So this also then becomes linked to mindfulness, which we'll get into in just a moment. But the basic idea here is that in the ancient world, they understood that part of the process of human alchemical development in a physical body in the physical world is what they called initiation trials, so that we are going to have certain challenges brought to us in a way that is going to make us step up to the next level of functioning by overcoming that challenge. You mean like what we're going through right now in the world? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we can't develop true discernment unless we live in a world full of lies and distortion. Right. Steiner talks a lot about that. And and so, you know, it's spiritual weightlifting. Yes, we it have is. To be... That's the name of my new book series. Uh, I love system. it. Spirit Gym. I love it. Uh, we Just like we get a stronger physical body resisting physical weights, we have to have these other types of resistances to develop real dynamic strength with it. And so there, we always have the challenge with these types of concepts of finding the center in the concept and not going to a polarized view of it. So on the one hand, you have the modern Western medical view of it, which is, oh, your illnesses are just some random abstract thing, it has nothing to do with you. Although in some cases, they might say, well, your lung cancer is linked to the fact that you're smoking too many cigarettes or something. But other than that, they don't really look too much at the person, certainly not at their psychology or their emotions or something like that to be a caus causative factor for a certain type of physical ailment. So at them, it's all mechanical. It's all external. And then on the other hand, we had the acknowledgement of how people can create their own challenges with what they hold in their emotional body and their mental body, etc., that came into metaphysics. And I remember a couple of decades ago, it was a very common thing to find in metaphysical circles that if someone had a particular type of uh, illness challenge, that you'd, you'd get always in some group, somebody would, in a rather flippant offhand way, say, oh, why did you create that? Yeah, or it's your karma, man. <laughs> yeah, but it was kind of like a thing about a kind of a non-compassionate view of like, oh, well, whatever your challenge is, you created that. And why did you do it type of thing? But it wasn't necessarily coming from a place of heartfelt compassion. No, it or was, empathy, not empathy. It wasn't empathy. It was coming from kind of a smart ass approach to the whole thing. And, and I didn't think that was particularly helpful for people who are like suffering tremendously because, because yes, we, we have these challenges that we often self generate. But we self-generated these things through <clears throat> coping mechanisms to overcome trauma and suffering in our lives. Like when we were a child, we learned to hold back the energy in a certain part of the body because it wasn't safe to express it or whatever it is. That's a suffering the person has. It leads to an illness down the road. But just to like blame them for it, I don't find is a particularly helpful approach. But if we can empower them with compassion that... You know, this is something that uh, was a pattern put into you a long time ago that you weren't even conscious of, and you may not be conscious of it now. If you become conscious of it, rather than trying to avoid it, like, I don't want to see that thing. If you go into it and go out the other side, that thing will turn inside out and the hidden gift inside of it will be, will be present. So when you find people with extraordinary gifts, it often came from having lost a particular fundamental function for a period of time. And then when they got it back, they were so conscious of what they had lost that they have it at a higher level. Example, Steiner talks about the way that the reason for monks taking vows of silence 
in the Middle Ages is that by losing that expression, that capacity, they became hyper aware of the power of speech. And so the way he describes it is they did it so they would develop magical powers of speech in future incarnations by losing it now. So we always have to see things in that larger comic, karmic context, yes. Context of how is this going to play out for the person over a greater span of time. And so if we see things from that perspective, we can also see that people may choose to take on certain karmic challenges that weren't even self-generated. It could be some type of health challenge that maybe they didn't generate it. It did come from the outside. Or they're put in a family situation. They didn't create that bad dynamic, but now you got to deal with it. You're, you're stuck in the middle of it because it's like a person going to the gym and saying, I'm going to take twice as many weights on my bar as the person next to me so yeah. that I can, I can develop that much faster than the other person. It's going to hurt. It's not going to be fun, but I'll develop faster if I do that. And sometimes this comes from, I mean, we see sometimes it's, oh, it's a person's dysfunctional and they're creating a dysfunctional life. That can certainly happen. We're not ruling that out. But there's also the aspect that some people who are very advanced spiritually, very developed, you find them having all types of horrible challenges in their lives that come from something that they took on in this lifetime to develop their strength as quickly as possible. And sometimes this actually comes from compassion within that person that before incarnation, they chose that challenge out of compassion because they knew at a future lifetime, they would need that skill that they were going to develop, that strength they would develop by going through this horrible thing at a future time to be able to help others. And if they didn't go through it now, they wouldn't have developed that skill for when they need it then. This is something that I think is a very deep spiritual concept that should give us some hesitancy in being too flippant with other people about their particular illness or other life challenges. Yes, we develop a lot of this stuff ourselves. Even so, I, I'm not a big fan of blaming the victim, but empowering them with understanding this can be shifted. You can work with this. And, and also understanding that in some cases, people take on these tremendous challenges in their life situation, etc., that you can see in many cases, people are creating this problem in their lives because of their dysfunctional way of living. But in other cases, it's like, I don't see where this person is creating this. It's, it's something that's coming to them, but it's to, it's to strengthen them that, you know, whatever does not destroy me makes me stronger, right? Yeah. And so this is definitely a part of that. And so even in, in many systems, they have systems of body reading and face reading, where you can tell a lot about a person's character and spiritual development, et cetera, by things that are present in their, their face and their body. And that's because part of this whole process of why are we incarnating physically to begin with? There's many all kinds of higher beings that aren't incarnating physically, and they're doing all kinds of things. Why are we doing it? Part of it is it develops the will forces to tremendous levels are going through this, but also has the effect that it reflects to us our level of development through what we see externally, that sometimes there's all these things that we can see externally, whether it's in health challenges or the structure of the physical body or something like that, that makes visible and unavoidable something in our own challenges of development, where we became too one-sided one way or another, and that gets externally reflected to us. So all of these things are part of the journey of human incarnation and human life to become more self-aware, which then leads us into the importance of mindfulness, because much of this is done by spirit to make us conscious of something we must be conscious of to overcome something that's holding us back and develop our potential to the highest level. And if we can, in our mindfulness, see it and shift it ourselves, they may not have to give us that horrific life situation that we'd prefer not to go through in the school of hard knocks. We may not have to go through that particular terrible illness because we've already shifted the background conditions in our mind and our emotions that we're, we're dealing with here. I wanted to ask you that question because I knew you'd have some powerful things to say. A couple of things came up for me. One, in Yogananda's writings, he talks about how for certain people, he would absorb their karma into himself and he would deal with it inside of himself because he felt some people had traumas and experiences that they shouldn't have to carry. So for 
key people, he would bring that into them, him, and he would deal with it as a very, very advanced master yogi uh, in, him, in his own body. He would take it on. So there's that. The other thing is, this is my experience. I'm curious to hear your thoughts to it. And, and I think the concept of the physical is a relative concept. You, you mentioned the other beings in other dimensions that may not take on physical bodies, but you know, I, I'm a remote viewer and I've done a lot. I do lots of work in the astral plane. In fact, I work in it most days and I can be in the astral world and be in my, what I call my light body or spirit body. And things are just as physical there as they are here. Because when I bring my vibration to, to a, to sympathetic resonance with the astral world, uh, there's, I can sit in tables and chairs and have meetings with people just like I'm talking to you now. So I think our concept of the physical has kind of got this limited viewpoint on it because from my own practices and spiritual experiences, I can tell you I can have meetings with people in what we would call other dimensions. In fact, I had a meeting with Carl Jung recently and had a very interesting conversation with him because I was curious what he's doing now. And I won't go into the whole discussion, but I'm sitting there with Carl Jung and, and here he's, he's in another body and he's telling me what's going on. I could touch the table he was sitting at, so on and so forth. So I think oh, we, you know, one of the ways I give this as an analogy to my students is say, okay, look, here's a, here's a video game. What you're looking at on the screen is just a bunch of photons. But if I could turn you into a video game player and put you in the game, then that car this guy's driving would be a car to you, just like the car is to me here, because you'd be in sympathetic resonance. So what's physical is relative to the vibrational level you're at. Before I move on to my other points, what do you think about that? No, I think it's extremely interesting. So this gets into the whole issue of we have the dense physical plane, and then we have the reflection of the dense physical plane at a certain level of the astral plane to where things are they're like they're solid. Now, this is something that is simply part of the way the world exists. Some higher planes, things are much more immaterial. You have much more interpenetration of beings and combinescence where the, the subtle bodies can interpenetrate and become one and doesn't have the type of spatial separation. So this has to do with sacred geometry of space and time that operates on the astral as well as it does on the physical. And so we have aspects of the astral that operate as if they were a physical plane. Now, this is something that is known to initiates as something that they sometimes need to navigate also to help people. So what can happen if a person, let's say they're highly materialistic in their physical life, and they have no concept of a higher spiritual world where you're in a light body that is not physical, and there are not things that are like a physical world around you. They're much more dynamic and intangible and things like that. But they, maybe they can't operate on that plane just yet. They don't have a level of development that they can even understand the dynamics that are operating on that plane. So people cross the threshold. All they know is physical life, physical world. And what happens is that they can do something that the great Greek Christian hermetic initiate Daskalos referred to as creating shell hells. <laughs> yeah. A, a shell hell is where a person basically recreates their physical environment from where they lived in the physical world as a structure on the astral plane. And they can get stuck there for a very long time. And they just think, I'm, I'm still alive. I'm still living because they've reconstructed it like a shadow of the physical plane on the astral. And Daskos would talk about he'd have to go to these places and talk to the people and say, hey, I got news for you. You're actually dead. And you've constructed the shell hell on the astral plane as a place that you can operate. But you actually need to go on to this higher world for some of these other processes that are that are present here. And this also then connects to the Tibetan teachings about the bardos and about what types of bardos exist. And there are some that are very similar to the physical plane and some that have very little in common to the physical plane at all that are very highly elevated. Interesting thing about this is when I was on the well, one of the podcasts for the Oxford Psychedelic Society recently uh, talking about psychotropic use, they had on a another presenter who runs the uh, Qualia Institute in California, great guy. 
And he was talking about his research into levels of DMT experience. And, and he was able to typify it as the types of rooms you go into based on the level of dosage. And it was like so interesting to see how this kind of correlates to the seven planes model based on the level of dosage people had with DMT to where sometimes it was like very much like the physical plane. And sometimes it was like a whole nother thing, extremely expanded. And so I do think it's very useful for people to hear about the types of things we're discussing now. Because we don't always have, I think, a, a very well laid out explanation in our modern Western society about what non-physical realms look like and what they can be experienced like. And there's such a great variety of them that they can go from those that are quite physicalized to those that are not very physical at all. A thought that came to me I'd like to hear your thoughts on is I would consider when I'm traveling and working with other people, be it spirit guides, or like I mentioned, I was talking to you. See, here we're, we we relate in space time. You know, I know you're, I don't know if you're in Las Vegas or where you're at right now, but for me to actually touch Robert physically, I have to travel a long way through space, which takes time. Time, time here is all based on relationships. But I feel from my understanding of time space, that when I'm working in these astral dimensions or higher vibrational dimensions, I'm more in a time space dimension because it's like a dream where you can actually, or even like a DMT journey, you, you, you know, a DMT journey only usually lasts about 12 minutes, but it can seem like a lifetime, <laughs> you know? So there you're in time space. Like you can be driving your car. You're moving in space time but be daydreaming and not even realize you just went through an intersection and can't remember if the light was green or red and go, holy shit. So you went from space time driving the car to time space where you're having a completely different experience. So I have a feeling intuitively that this these higher vibrational planes, a lot of them are, are nested in our soul spirit as time space versus space time. I'm just curious what your thoughts in that regard are. Yes, I think this goes back to you have the the top down view and you have the bottom up view. So that the time structure, I believe it precedes the space structure. But they both are based on sacred geometry. But where we are in the in our spatial world, we tend to think first of the spatial world and then time. Like for me to go from this space to that space, it takes that amount of time. But from a higher perspective, this whole time thing becomes a whole different world. So one of my favorite topics in spiritual science is the concept of the initiation known as the vision of the eagle. So the vision of the eagle initiation is where if we think of time as a river, using a metaphor of a physical river, then time is the river. Most people are standing on the bank of the river and they see this, this one moment in time. Every presentation I do, I talk about memento mori. Remember that you will die. We're in here for a very short time. I often like to say that, that life is a limited time opportunity. You better make good use of your time here because it's, it's a finite resource. And normally we're only aware of this exact moment in time right now. And then all of a sudden we wake up and we're old and maybe we're going to croak and like, ah, what's going to happen? <laughs> so, but if we actually move our consciousness up like an eagle does, and goes above the river, it can see the river from its beginning to the end. Yeah. And that's where you see all these incredible classical spiritual texts that are from a perspective outside of time, where time is just another sacred geometry structure, just like space, that the spatial events will occur inside of that container. And this also begins to give us some insight into the simultaneity of time. So one sign of a person having reach a higher state of consciousness is that they can attain certain states where time is simultaneous, past, present, future. They're all happening at the same moment. One thing I really appreciated about the graphic novel Watchmen by Alan Moore is when he describes this being, Dr. Manhattan, who like became like a super being and like a Manhattan experiment type of nuclear thing. He's got to try to figure out how to navigate in the world when he has simultaneous consciousness of past moments of time, present moment of time, and future moments of time. So at the same moment that he's meeting a woman, he's experiencing 
making love with her in the initial stages, experiencing the fighting with her at a later stage, and experiencing the end of the relationship in a terrible breakup at a later time. But it's all simultaneous. And so one of the big things about higher consciousness is developing mobility in time to where we put our consciousness and even being able to see whole time structures and how they fit together. Huge topic, but one that I find endlessly fascinating. And I think it's extremely interesting that Dr. Ibrahim Karim, founder of Biogeometry, his master textbook that he just put out called Hidden Reality is all about these aspects of space and time and navigation of them. I'm, I to just put in a quick plug here that I've been communicating with Ibrahim recently, and he's planning to come to the United States to offer a special topics course for the people that have completed the advanced training in biogeometry, which you can do online. He's going to, we're now setting that up for him to come and teach in the United States for the first time in, I don't know how many years, 10 years or something. Uh, that's going to be the current schedule, it could change, is September 2024. And he's going to be going into very deep aspects of these processes. So I love this whole topic about space time dynamics and things like biogeometry. We can make it quite practical. And it's a lot of what's coming down the pike in the next levels of biogeometry. Just for listeners, because time space is quite confusing for a lot of people because we're so kind of conditioned into space time. So I would just share this with everyone listening. Whatever you're doing right now, unless you're driving, if you're driving, just listen, don't do it. But if you just expand your awareness to the surface of your body, you can say, okay, I'm aware of my body, but now expand your awareness to fill the room of your house. Now expand your awareness to fill the yard or the outer area. And if you keep going, you can expand yourself to the very outer edges of the physical universe. So now what you see is that you are not in a space-time relationship because to travel to the outer edges of the universe would take you longer than you could ever even calculate <laughs> moving at the speed of light. I mean, you could calculate it, but I mean... It takes you about a hundred, over a hundred years just to get out of the Milky Way galaxy moving at the speed of light. And there's about, I don't know, two trillion galaxies last time they counted. And it gets bigger every time we big, build a bigger telescope. But there you can see that time space allows you to manipulate space within the time that you have within your own mind, where in space time, you're bound by the physical relationship. So I just wanted to share that as a sort of a simple exercise. And like I said, you can daydream and have a whole experience while you're driving your car and not even realize that you just made love to somebody while you were you know, driving the last mile and lived half a lifetime with them. So there's time, space versus space time. I remembered Margaret Newman's book. It's health as, uh, the name is Health as Expanding Consciousness. And I wanted to bring up a, a point on our topic of illnesses as spiritual opportunities versus health versus illness, Jung describes at many places in his work how a neurosis is an essential means of dissipating psychic energy, like problematic psychic energy. Things are having a hard time facing or they don't want to face or they don't have the sense or consciousness that they can resolve. So the neurosis is sort of like a relief valve, just like a semi truck. When the air tanks reach 140 PSI, you hear, because it's got to release the air or the tank will explode. So a neurosis is really the release valve. And this is why we have a lot of, of you know, skin conditions and digestive troubles and a whole long litany of, of these things, because these are symptoms of release. And Jung says that most people without their neurosis would commit suicide. He said neurosis is actually a healthy thing to have because when you have a neurosis, you can still work with what's going on versus waiting till you kill yourself because you just can't take it anymore. So you can see that a lot of people go to doctors and therapists for illnesses that are actually a neurosis, and they're trying to actually knock out the symptoms, which for me as a therapist, I never do that. I always say we have to work backward to see what it is that this is a symptom of, which is why I use art therapy and journaling and plant medicines and every other mechanism for getting into their unconscious and soul connection and tarot. And I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to get down inside the basement. And, you know, the, 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 the things that people learn are 
often very mind blowing. I mean, you you know, you can learn past life stuff. I've had, you know, I do past life regressions for people when it's necessary, but I've had people, for example, that died in wars. One of my patients had chronic stomach pain and nothing we were doing was resolving. And I just connected to that person's soul and said, you know, what's going on? And their soul said, look, this person was wounded by a spear in a past life. Now, I didn't tell them this. And I said, well, should I do a past life regression? And I did. And sure enough, my patient started going into severe pain and, and was just crying and buckling over. And I said, what are you experiencing? And my patient said to me, Paul, I'm, I'm in a battlefield and somebody has just drove one of these long spears right through my stomach. And I, I'm, I'm dying. And I said, well, pull the spear out. Now that you know that you are wounded there, pull the spear out and let's see what happens. And so the client went through the act of pulling the spear out. And after we did the regression and I did some integration work with this client, their stomach problem went away. They had had this for years. And I've had, I could sit here and give you a dozen more cases like that. So I think there's a lot of these things that we, a lot of the standard approach to healing is too shallow. You know, we don't have enough depth. And I think a lot of that has right to do with the scientific materialistic mindset. I think it's trapping us in flatland and too small of a reality. And unfortunately, you know, the World Economic Forum and the globalists are trying to cement us right into that reality. And I think this is why I like having conversations with people like you, because it helps us see beyond the limitations of just a physical world. But if we don't start relating to ourselves and relating to each other in a more multidimensional perspective, we aren't going to ever really achieve the kind of freedom that we're capable of. And that, that sets us right up for my next question. Are you ready for the next question? Let me just make a quick comment. I'm pushing my luck here with the comment I'm about to make. But I, I uh, like the story you just told about the past life regression. The person remembered the, the trauma of the penetration of the gut with the spear. If you're pushing the... your luck, it means it's going to be good. <laughs> okay. Good. So... Uh, I did a lot of past life regression, both for myself and with other people, uh, when I was training at the Clear Vision School of Australia with the late French medical doctor Samuel Sagan back in the 90s, and learned a lot from it. And they definitely find that this type of embedded trauma is leading to physical issues in the body and things that medical science will not figure out because they're based on embedded trauma. But I, I found a very interesting aspect of this, that once a person gets in touch with where the damage is in the body, like we would scan the person's body, see where there's an energetic disturbance, you put your hand there to keep their attention on it, they go into it in a method they would learn to like see what's held there, we would work through it and they go out the other side of it. When you go out the other side, like we mentioned before, things kind of turn inside out. And so the place that we had the issue, we became hyper-conscious of. In a way, another person will never be conscious of that part of the body because they have no problem there. If you have no problem in your heart, you have no problem in your stomach, you have no problem in whatever, you don't really think about it. But when you have a challenge there, which may be linked to a past life trauma in some cases, then you become hyper-conscious of it. And so in the beginning, you're hyper-conscious because either you've lost something you, you want, like you lost your arm and now you don't have an arm and you're very conscious of what you've lost, or you have a pain, a suffering there also makes you hyper-conscious. So this is all about your idea here about consciousness and illness, right? It makes us more conscious of that thing. Now, once a person clears that energetic challenge, once they go into it, it turns inside out, they're out the other side, your particular client didn't have any more uh, stomach pain after they remembered this and went out the other side. One thing I found that's extremely interesting, going back to Wilhelm Reich's work, because Reich is all about you know, he was the founder of the sexual revolution about how we have to reclaim the life energy in our body, which is what the sexual energy is. You have to reclaim your own life energy. One thing that I found is that the places in the body where people had had terrible wounds, where they had been tortured, they had been killed in previous lifetimes, and they had a trauma they had to work through there. After they work through the trauma, that area of the body becomes an erogenous zone. Oh, interesting. 
it becomes a part of the body that they have increased sensitivity in and increased consciousness of. So it becomes a place that can experience more pleasure Mm. than the average person could experience in that part of the body through this whole process. It's kind of like in the great book, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, where he talks about how we get hollowed out with sharp knives to create a space within us that can then be filled with joy. Ah. So this is the karmic recompense. So lots of times people don't want to go into past life regression and things like this because I don't want to experience this. I don't want to remember it. It's too painful. I tell them you already are. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're already in it. So you might as well go out the other side. But the thing I like to represent to them is like, and here's here's not just the stick, but here's the carrot. Go through it and out the other side. And these places of suffering are going to become places of expanded sensation and consciousness and will become places of additional pleasure beyond what the average person could experience in that part of the body. Hi, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying the podcast. You know, a couple of months ago, Organifi sent me a couple of bags of their new Sheila J gummies to sample, and I was blown away with how great they taste and how much my body loved them. Having used Shilla J paste for many years, I've never been a big fan of the taste of it, but when I tried Organifi's new Shilla J gummies, I was truly impressed. The texture and consistency of the gummies is excellent, and they have just enough natural sweetness to let me feel like I'm getting a lovely, healthy treat for both my mind and my body. Shilla J is a unique, potent mineral paste from the Himalayan mountains. It contains an abundance of trace minerals, antioxidants, organic acids, and nutrient-transporting compounds. It's been known throughout history to help boost vitality and strength. Just pop a couple gummies and chew, or suck on them slowly for a steady release of the delicious, earthly, but slightly sweet natural flavor. Your taste buds will enjoy the delicious treat while your body soaks up the massive amounts of feel-good nutrition. Rich in fulvic acid, humic acid, vitamins, enzymes, bioflavonoids, antioxidants, metabolites, and over 40 trace minerals, Sheila J gummies can help support energy production, support performance and recovery, support healthy muscles, promote collagen synthesis, support healthy hormone levels, increase cellular energy, decrease fatigue, and promote heart health. I absolutely love Organifi's Shilla J gummies and went through two bags in no time because my body craved them so much. I reached out to Organifi to get more right away, and I bet you will too. To get your 20% off for Living 4D listeners on your Shilla J gummies, go to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash C-H-E-K 20. On checkout, use the promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, 20. That's check 20 on checkout to get your 20% discount on your awesome Shilla J gummies. I honestly love these things. I know you're going to be just amazed with how great they taste and how good they feel. You know, in my own career, because I pretty much deal with challenge cases that most people can't figure out. So... I've always had to do a lot of work and look to say, okay, you know, what are the different ways we can work with some of these challenges? And so I'll, you know, hear from somebody like you, try this or try that. I'll go study it. I'll take a course or two on it and test it out. And, and uh, you know, I've just expanded my toolkit. But I, I really think that I, I have tremendous sadness for the amount of people that just get stuck in the orthodox medical system. And, you know, have this cut out, then that cut out, and they're on this drug and that drug, and their their whole, their life force diminishes, their life becomes more and more constricted until they're in a wheelchair or, or they die. And I watch this with great sadness because, you know, I don't know what the percentage would be, but there's a very significant percentage of people out there that are really suffering that in the hands of skilled therapists would never have not only would they not be suffering, they would have become much more awake and spiritually evolved through the process of using these types of technologies, whether it be soul recovery or past life regression or energy therapies or art therapy. I mean, there's a long list, you know that, but I'm really just sharing that this is a, you know, we have to get past the scientific materialist paradigm and this thing that is concerning to me is that 
the forces that be are trying to push us even deeper into the damn thing, you know, and that's, that's, uh, that's something people need to wake the hell up to because we can't, we cannot afford to go deeper into a materialist existence because we are actually on the edge of destroying the entire ecosystem that we survive in right now. And, and one step further into materialism and we're all dead. I hate to say it. Yeah. We're, we're I totally dead. agree. Yeah. You know, Robert Steiner left us with a spiritual science for modern times. I have a few questions. What is the unconscious? How does it work? And why is it important to understand? You know, the unconscious is talked about differently by different people. For example, if you study Steiner and compare him to Jung, they're not often saying the same things, even though they're using the same word. You could go through a number of people. I've even had people right on my podcast that tell me they don't believe that the unconscious exists. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I would just love to hear what you say, particularly if you can share Steiner's perspective. My understanding at this stage of Steiner's perspective on the unconscious is that everything is conscious, but at different levels that are accessible by different types of beings or beings of particular states of evolution. So uh, he would, I, I believe that he would prefer, and again, there'd be people that know more about Steiner than me that correct this of what Steiner thought about the unconscious. But my impression was always with Steiner that these things are below or sometimes above our current state of consciousness, whatever that is, because everybody has a particular magnitude of their consciousness. The larger that magnitude, the fewer things are in the unconscious. They, they become conscious. But for the average person who's operating at a, a very basic level, that vast majority of all information and insights are completely unconscious to them. They're simply not aware at those levels. And so there's the aspect of, number one, how do we expand our consciousness to the things that are currently unconscious to us? We can become conscious of, and that's really the foundation of mindfulness. We start by just observing where we are right now and keep expanding that outwards. Let the mind take its full possibilities to go into these things. And so the unconscious, conscious dialectic, I think, is also connected to the issue about multiple planes of existence. So there's a fascinating discussion that Dr. Kareem gave one time about, you know, if we think about, we got a physical body, a vitality body, emotional, mental, causal, spiritual, divine, that in ancient Egypt, they understood that every one of these different subtle bodies in us is a separate conscious being. Things that's unconscious to me as Robert Gilbert that's going on in my body right now is completely conscious to some entity, although we don't mean that in a bad sense, some, some, some conscious being that exists at that level that knows how to run my physical body, that knows how to run my vitality body. I'm, I don't, I'm not consciously myself right now making the energy run in my meridian or making my heart pump or whatever else might be going on. Digesting, metabolizing, assimilating. But there's a, a type of a conscious being inside of us. And so in, in the ancient Egyptian understanding, it'd be a matter of just like for the medieval world that you receive the conversation of the holy guardian angel, a being that is to some degree above you in its consciousness and then can share with you things that are currently unconscious to you, but it knows. That would be one process. In ancient Egypt, they understood this for every one of the subtle bodies. So you could ask questions to or get into a dialogue with the physical body or the vitality body or whatever. So they would call them you know, different names in ancient Egypt so that our idea of the energy body uh, was basically the ka. Our idea of the astral body was basically the ba, these types of things. But there's like something within us that's part of our totality that allows us to work in these vehicles with our causes at a current stage that knows how all these things work. And depending on who you ask, you'll get different Answers. So interesting observation of this later to the unconscious is that it's well known in mental dowsing circles. Now, again, what we do in biogeometry is not mental dowsing, it's direct vibrational testing. It's a different thing. But in mental dowsing, which have also been around for many, many years, I'm a former keynote speaker at the annual national convention for the American Society of Dowsers multiple times. So I pretty much know what's going on in mental dowsing. And in mental dowsing, it's well understood that if you have an emotional investment, in the answer you're trying to get through mental dowsing, there's a high probability you're going to influence the answer you get and it's not as dependable. Quantum physics would tell you that for sure. 
<laughs> but there's another aspect of this seen from this old Egyptian temple perspective, which is that if you ask the being at your emotional body level, something that you've got a big investment in, like, I so love this person, do they love me back? Or, you know, I'm terrified of death, am I going to die soon? Or something like this. That's something that that being at the emotional plane level knows everything about the emotional body, but it's highly reactive. The emotional body being is pretty reactive. But if, And if you get the answer from them, there's no telling what you're going to get. But if you ask the question to the being at, let's say, the spiritual or d- divine level, they are so far above the space-time caring about, is this person going to love you for a limited time or when you're going to die before the next incarnation or whatever, that they'll give you a very objective answer. So there's if the you're brave enough then, to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're ready for it. <laughs> so so this is there's a beautiful statement, I think, relates directly to this discussion by uh, Dr. Samuel Sagan of the Clair Vision School, where he said that your ability to see spiritually is governed by your ability to not react to what you see. Yes, I heard you say that in Danica Patrick's podcast, and I thought that's exactly what I've experienced. It takes a lot of what I call spiritual courage to really get answers to tough questions. It does. So, you know, this all then comes down. This is really what I founded Vesca on. How do we expand our consciousness and our energy, the Shiva and Shakti within us, to the highest possible extent? How do we make the most use of this very limited time opportunity of physical incarnation right now? And so, again, that's where it brings us then to expand our consciousness into things that are currently unconscious. Then, just like they had certain methods in ancient Egypt and other cultures to do this, one of the foundations that we have is mindfulness. And mindfulness starts with self-observation. So you find this, whether it's the mindfulness in Buddhism, or whether it's Gurdjieff's work on self-remembering and self-observation. It's all about simply becoming conscious of what's happening to you right now. What's the content of your thoughts? What's the content of your emotions? What's the content of your will forces and your actions? Not trying to excuse anything, but seeing it as objectively as if you're observing somebody other than yourself. And, And not making excuses for whatever's dysfunctional in our current state. Now, what's fascinating in the work of Steiner with this is that, of course, this mindfulness at the three Dantian, our thinking, our feeling, our willing, is going to expand our consciousness in things that are currently unconscious. He brings out that this also has an effect of structuring the subtle body in a way that's essential. Because we talked about the way that our consciousness in the head and our dynamic life forces in the abdomen are two opposite polarities. This burns up the life energy. It's a, it's a death process, as Steiner talks about. But we get all this vital life force from the abdominal forces. Well, what holds the balance between the two is the heart. And so in the sacred geometry of the heart, we know from the Himalayan tradition that there's 12 lotus petals in the heart, really 12 vortices. But every one of those is governed with a particular quality, a particular part of our consciousness that we can expand into what is currently unconscious. So Steiner describes the way that when he gives out the most fundamental exercise for Rosicrucianism, which is called the six basic or the six essential exercises, he says of those 12 lotus petals of the heart, six of them we've developed in previous incarnations. The other six must be consciously developed right now. So each of the six exercises in the six fundamental exercises of the Rosicrucians is developing one of the six remaining lotus petals. And it's the, this is the very simple explanation. There's a lot more to it that I go into great detail in the essential teachings and practices of spiritual science course, which is my introductory spiritual science course for people to expand consciousness that you have to observe completely neutrally and then direct your thinking. Observe and then direct your feeling. Observe and then direct your will forces and actions. You have to develop tremendous positivity in understanding every life event and also develop tremendous equanimity and openness to new information and seeing things from new perspectives. And then the sixth one is to harmonize all this together. When Steiner gave these indications, they were very brief. And in Essential Teachings and Practices course, I expand it much, much further to make it very useful for people. But if we do that, as we're expanding our conscious into these unconscious areas, starting with mindfulness, self-observation, and the direction then of our, our forces to their highest potential, 
what happens is that the heart gets online. The heart will become a fully active structure in the human energy body and will create a center for the entire movement of all consciousness and energy inside the body. And until we develop the heart as that organizing center, we don't have an organizing center. And so this is something that, you know, I make a very major part of my first course in spiritual science. And I think it's, uh, you know, shows the way that we create exercises as a practical way to expand our consciousness into the unconscious levels and our, our lives improve dramatically based on that. Yeah. And you, for those that aren't aware, you have an amazing series on sacred geometry on Gaia TV, and you give meditations for each of the stages along the way for your teachings in that series. And I think, you know, there's a, a free introduction to Robert's excellent teachings. So you realize with even just a free visit to Gaia that what his courses are about is actually really very real. And, and it's not a bunch of foo-foo. There's practical exercises and development. So I just wanted to point that out because I forgot to mention about your series. I love that series. I love how beautifully uh, illustrated it was graphically. It, it really allowed, I think, people to take concepts that are often hard to understand and, and see them through visual imagery, which was fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. This is an important one. I think this is why it's a good one to end on. How can becoming more conscious, like it's obvious that it's important to become more conscious to contribute to world harmony and to the awakening at this time. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on what it is that any one of us can do. I mean, we've talked about mindfulness. We've talked about a lot of different therapeutic approaches. But if you imagine right now, we're talking to a lot of people that have never done any of these things. They might not have meditated. They don't, they've don't. they never practiced Tai Chi, Qigong, and yoga. And then what are the ramifications of staying unconscious? And, and you know, Jung had a lot to say about the dangers of staying unconscious. And I'll give you one quote for everybody. I've said it before, but it can't be heard enough. Until you meet your unconscious on the inside, it will continue to meet you on the outside in the event, in the events of your life, and you will call it fate. Now you can take that and expand that to the world population and say, as long as we collectively remain unconscious, then the events of our lives will meet us on the outside and we will call it fate. And look at all this Armageddon prophecy going around from all sorts of sectors right now. To me, that's just remaining unconscious and looking for a, a, a good way to categorize fate because you're unconscious of the fact that you can actually use your own intention to change the outcome. We're all contributing to the outcome. So if you could share what you feel with your life experience and your depth of knowledge, what do you think we can all do right now to become more conscious? How important that is that to the outcome of the events of the world? And what's the cost of not doing it? So one of the first things here is that we need to be aware that every time we incarnate, we're taking care of two counterbalanced things at the same time. One is our own personal development to get to where we're happier, more joyful, more advanced, more capable, getting out of the pain and suffering that's unnecessary. And the other part of it is the service we provide to other people. These two things are always counterbalanced, the self and the other. So as we, we work on this, both aspects are directly connected to how unconscious or conscious we are. So the Buddhists have a beautiful way of expressing it when they say that, you know, you can either take skillful action or you can take unskillful action. Now, you will develop an either path, but the unskillful action where you're just a reactive machine reacting to all kinds of things and have no control over your thoughts, your feelings, or your actions, you're going to learn through the school of hard knocks. That will not only make you suffer unnecessarily, you're going to make all kinds of people around you suffer through your unskillful action. And on top of that, you're taking away the possibility of lessening other people's suffering by choosing skillful action. So there's both the positive and the negative part of it. You're actively going to be harming people around you. And on top of that, you're not giving the benefit of the things that you could be helping with if you're chosen the other path. So on the skillful action path, 
which is based on mindfulness and on moving our consciousness to deeper into our unconscious. So it's we keep expanding the state of our awareness. Now, the skillful action path, not only are we getting out of suffering much more quickly and effectively, because everything comes down to the basic neuro-linguistic programming idea that we will seek pleasure and we will avoid pain. But what's changeable here is that it's up to you to choose what you associate pain and pleasure with. We're programmed in an unconscious way to what we associate pain and pleasure with, which is why someone who's a heroin addict keeps being a heroin addict because they associate pleasure with it, but I associate pain with that, so I have no attraction to it whatsoever. And so going from the unskillful to skillful means is changing your pain-pleasure associations so the things that are going to be bad in the long run are associated with pain, and the things that will be beneficial, we associate pleasure with, even though they might be hard work. So this basic fundamental understanding of human development brings us into the whole thing about the cost of staying unconscious. Not only will you suffer, you'll make everyone around you suffer. And the benefit of becoming conscious is not only will you get out of suffering more effectively and become the person you're meant to be, which will be a much more enjoyable life, but you'll help the people around you with this as well. Because we have to be aware, again, with memento mori, you have a very limited time here. This time is going to end. There's certain things you need to be in physical incarnation to do and to accomplish. Use your time here wisely. Don't just fritter the time away. Because when you cross the gate of death, one of the first experiences you're going to have is what Steiner refers to at a certain point of the journey is meeting the lesser and greater guardian of the threshold. And what that's going to mean is you're going to perceive the effect that your life had not only on you, the choices you made, how conscious you were, had on you, but the effect on everyone else. But now you're going to experience that effect on everyone else from the way they experienced it. You'll be inside of them, experiencing exactly how you made them feel. This is a hell-like experience for people who are choosing the unskillful path and are not choosing to become more conscious, who are staying unconscious. It's a it's a long, drawn-out astral experience that's extremely unpleasant as you feel how everyone around you suffered for all the years of your existence based on how screwed up you were. But it could be a highly pleasurable experience if you were actually a blessing and a boon to everyone around you. And be aware that in that out-of-body state after death, it's like you're in an amplifier of everything related to mind, emotions, etc., because there's no physical body to damp it down anymore. You're you're affected by this in a way that's hard for people to conceive who haven't done a lot of psychotropics yeah. of being completely <laughs> naked in this realm, right? Yes, that's exactly right. What you just said that's that's your preparation right there. Die that's before right. you die, boys and girls. Die exactly. First. So so be aware that this has a huge impact on your own life and on other people's lives, and Again, we all seek pleasure and avoid pain. So this gives the most fundamental thing in the world. Constantly work with mindfulness to expand your consciousness, and you'll get the life that you want, and you'll help to give other people the life that they want. And over time, this is going to create a magnificent outcome compared to all the people who are choosing not to exert the effort to become consciousness and all the damage we can see them causing in the world right now and to themselves. And I'll include myself in that. I still have parts of myself I'd better wake up and be more conscious on as well. It's never me versus them. It's all of us, and we constantly work with us. Yeah, we're all an, an infinite process. I mean, most people can't conceive of the journey back to source. How, you know, how many, you know, think of each dimension as a whole new experience. I mean, it's a long ways. I mean, the astral realm itself is massive and uh, many people i've studied say it's far 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 bigger than the universe that we think we know it, my father's house has many mansions absolutely yeah <laughs> and so you know i guess in a nutshell what you're saying is now is the time to really invest some time into something as simple but as real as mindfulness practice, there's a lot of great mindfulness teachers out there. John Kabat Zen, probably the most famous of them. Thich Nhat Han, uh, I love Thich Nhat Han's stuff. It's sad that he's passed away, but he's proof of your <laughs> this too shall pass. 
we shoot, we will pass. But what a great teacher he was and a great example. I think we're at a point where we really need, you know, Steiner talks about the the birth of the awareness soul and the way you birth the awareness soul is you ask yourself the question, is it really true? No matter what it is, you ask, is it really true? Is it really true that uh, the best person to go see is a doctor? Is it really true you should believe everything your government tells you? Is it really true that uh, money will make you happy? Is it really true that sex will make you happy? I mean, because if we don't start asking, is it really true, then we don't ever see what's in our unconscious. When you ask, is it really true, you have to now challenge everything that you were taught have now brought into the realm of automatic response without thinking about it. You don't need to worry about, is it really true that I need to, I, I know how to tie my shoe because that's not going to have a big impact on your life. But your beliefs about God, about love, about sex, about relationships, about money, about power, uh, how you get attention. I mean, these things are all really worth asking, is it really true? So mindfulness and asking, is it really true? And then I will throw one of my favorites, which is, you know, a tough one. What would love do now? I'm in this situation. I'm angry at somebody. I'm pissed off at my wife or my husband or whatever. Um, or I'm about to lose my job. I'm scared to death. What would love do now? Uh, I mean, I think you can get a lot of mileage by really answering that question honestly and acting in accordance with it. It's a practice for me and I have to work at it. I got a warrior in me and a dragon in me that I got to be careful with because I'm, you know, I grew up in a battlefield. You, you know, when I was a young man, you wanted to throw down. I'm like, let's go. Let's get it on, baby. But that's, you know, that's not how you grow spiritually. That's just how you uh, encapsulate yourself <laughs> in a physical body <laughs> for a lot longer. <laughs> but anyhow, Robert, what a phenomenal time with you. I sure love and appreciate you, Robert Gilbert, man. You're a, you're a great example for all of us. And, and I'm uh, just grateful. Why don't you tell everybody, um, give a recap on the courses that you think would be best for people listening and uh, give us the web address. And I don't know if there's, I can't remember if there's a discount code for podcast listeners or what. I'm sure, we'll have it all in the show notes either way, but what would you like to share in that regard? Great. Thank you so much. And I feel the same way, Paul. I always enjoy my time with you. It's great to you. be able to explore all these things together. Thanks for having me back again. It's Pleasure. great. So my website is www.vesica.org. And Bessica is spelled B as in Victor, E-S-I-C-A dot O-R-G. And uh, the question about the courses to begin with, if you're interested in the biogeometry courses uh, that I teach under licensing from Dr. Kareem, an online training, then you'll find that on my website, Starts with the Foundation Training. Then there's another one called the Advanced Training. And if you get the Advanced done before we think currently it's going to be September 2024, you'd be eligible to come to the live event with Dr. Kareem, which is a very rare opportunity. So I highly suggest that. For sure. Then I have on the spiritual science track to develop energy and consciousness. The first course to begin with is called Essential Teachings and Practices of Spiritual Science. That has the six fundamental exercises of the Rosicrucians and a lot of other observations that are the absolute foundation of types of spiritual development that are very practical and that will make a change in your life very quickly. Then on the vibrational science side, what I refer to as the SEER program, Subtle Energy Explorations and Research, then we have, in addition to the biogeometry work, I've created courses on the French research in the early 1900s. If you want to know the foundation of what the French called medical radiesthesia, where you could test all the subtle energies that are present in a person's body and test things that are strengthening or weakening to them in a way that goes beyond what's possible with educational kinesiology and goes into all types of amazing testing and balancing work based on the French medical doctor's work of the early 1900s, which has been almost forgotten in a, in a completely energetic method of detecting these invisible energetic interactions. That's called the personal wavelength course. And then if you want to understand about all of the invisible energies around us, 
and how they create this invisible energy matrix. That's called the Universal Vibrational Spectrum Course, and that's also available online on my site. There's lots of other stuff there too. Again, early 2024, I'll be putting up the New Year's Resource Guide with more information on the microcurrent. I've got links already for the cymatics and the cymotherapy, things of that kind. So please do come to the site and check it out. Thank you. Awesome, Robert. I'll just close real quick and say thank you to all of you for joining us today. If you've listened this far, I know you are definitely part of the change because you can't listen to Robert Gilbert without having some positive (laughs) effects. So uh, thank you to my sponsors for your love and support and all the amazing products you do and your uh, regenerative practices beyond sustainable. And thanks to each of you for anything you buy from the sponsors that supports the podcast and helps me uh, have the ability to do the research and find people and do all the things we do to make great podcasts. And lots of love to all of you. I hope you guys see that the transition we're going through in the world is really no different than an illness that's going to teach us how to be more free, how to be more loving, more empathetic, more compassionate. And in order to get there, we got to work on it together. So now's our chance. Can't wait to share something again with you next week. See you then. Robert, have a great rest of your day, bud. Lots of love. Thanks so much, Paul. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Robert Gilbert. Visit the Visica Institute online at visica.org, where you can learn more about their study programs. As Dr. Gilbert mentioned, you can get $75 off two of his most popular online courses. Use the promo code PAUL75, that's P-A-U-L, all uppercase, 75. When you register for the Essential Teachings and Practices of Spiritual Science course or the Personal Wavelength course, you can learn more about both courses and all the other courses produced by Dr. Gilbert at visica.org or email info at visica.org. That's info at V-E-S-I-C-A dot org. Catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok and threads at paul.check, on X at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at czechinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Organifi and Paleo Valley, and our podcast sponsor, Wild Pastures. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for our listeners. The links are in the show notes. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. 